the Fed and Powell in particular needs to get across the message that the job is not yet done. It's not just about what the ECB does and what the Fed does. You have to take into account the market's inflation premium. We're really playing a game where the market desperately wants the Fed to react. We are still very much in the early days of recovering off of an extreme low. Right now, central banks everywhere will take anything they can get. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. This week is dragging on. First thing Lisa said to me, Tom, it's taken ages just to get to Friday. Look, this market's not exactly helping out. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning Snooze for first. our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Futures TK down about a tenth of 1%. Three days of losses into Wednesday ahead of Jackson Hole. Yeah, some sport here, and it's a finely acquired market, John. I'm going to really call it a pre pal churn going on this morning. But beneath the churn, there's a lot going on. John, to me, the headline is Netherlands natural gas has not given it up. To me, that's the headline this morning. Did we get the appetizer for the next headline from Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed? He spoke yesterday evening, Tom. He said, we are at very high inflation. This is a completely unbalanced situation, which means to me it's very clear. He goes on to say, TK, we need to tighten monetary policy to bring things back into balance. He wants to go big. Wants more, Tom, potentially another 75. The aerospace engineer, the Uber dove out of Minneapolis, and, and you know, when you hear Kashkari talk like that, imagine what we're going to hear from those people we and Mike McKee will speak to in, in, in Jackson Hole. I, I think it's just real simple, John. Forward guidance is going to be very forward here as we wait for a data-dependent speech. Bramo, do you think it's too early for Chairman Powell to pre-commit to a September move, given how much data is still to come in between now and then? Let's say he does commit to a September move. Does that move the markets, or have the markets already moved ahead of some sort of commitment on that level akin to the hawkishness that certainly has been the tone to all of the analyst notes? I mean, how do you deal with the market? It's pricing in a reaffirmed hawkishness to a Fed. How does the how is the shape how will deliver on that given that it would have to take some pre-commitment or something other than just rhetoric? For those interested in the path ahead, September 2nd we get the payrolls report. We get another CPI report on September 13th. And I have to say, Lisa, after the PMIs of yesterday, <clears throat> which were dreadful, and not just in Europe, but also here in the United States. I have to say the ISM takes on a little bit more importance too. Especially because also anecdotal information, like the earnings that we've seen from Nordstrom, for example, showing that even middle class and even upper middle class shoppers are starting to push back and be much more discretionary in the buildup of inventory. How much does this lead to this feeling of a disinflationary push that the Fed is going to, uh, you know, perhaps <clears throat> respond to in a way that would not be that hawkish? Which is a bit snoozy this morning. Morning. CK's it's language, generous. not mine. Futures down by two it's points. We're negative 0.05% on the S&P 500. Looking at the bond market, yields unchanged, 3.0443% on a 10-year, a lift over the last week. In the FX market, 99.47 euro weakness returns, at least a euro dollar negative, a quarter of 1%. Yeah, just sort of shocking to see that persistence. You know, John, I keep thinking about the hawkishness that people are expecting from the Federal Reserve, from Fed Chair Jay Powell, and then wondering about the disinflationary trends that we continue to see in the data that's trickling in. You mentioned what we saw yesterday with some of the, uh, the PMIs out of the U.S. Also the housing market. Today we get July durable goods orders at 8.30 a.m. as well as July pending home sales at 10 a.m. And this comes after yesterday's home uh, information that was dreadful. You are seeing activity fall off a cliff and the expectation is that pending home sales will be the same. This is noisy information. This is really important because yesterday uh, the number of activity, the number of sales actually completed uh, it really fell off a cliff but a lot of it had to do with homes that had not yet been completed so there's a lot of noise under these numbers at 1 p.m. the Treasury is auctioning off 45 billion dollars of five-year notes yesterday's two-year auction was fascinating it was the third worst going back to 2018. Basically, people don't want to bid on something that is trading like a penny stock, which is basically the rates market on the front end, given all of the uncertainty around what the Fed's going to do. I am more interested in the five-year yield. How much do people have conviction over the medium range of what the Fed's going to do? Where are they going to top out with the Fed funds rate? What is that going to mean for the economic outlook and inflation? And today, President Biden is expected to announce student debt relief program. John. Super awkward for him because on one hand he has people in his own camp saying it's not generous enough to propose $10,000 of debt relief for people with a certain income. Other people saying you're really going to do this now at a time when we're worried about inflation. Either way, it's a very uh, controversial issue and one that he plans to unveil. 
later today. The policy is super complex. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie a little bit later this morning. Bramo, I've got to squeeze this in. The drought that you mentioned to start the week, that you said we should focus on, China. China, China, China in the news in a big way, given their extreme drought and the threat to hydro electric stations in the country. This is a global story. I have been tracking this so closely. You're seeing a global drought. And for China, the global drought is leading to a decline in manufacturing, which is leading to potential further supply chain disruptions. They cannot catch a break. Some people saying this is potentially worse than some of the COVID outbreaks that they've seen. We got to keep watching the space and really track how it's affecting not only China, Germany and the US, but also the developing world. Elisa, thank you for drawing our attention to that. I wish I could cheer you up, but our next guest in his notes, it calls for the RIP cycle. It's Jim Karen, fixed income portfolio manager at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Jim, help me out here. What is the RIP cycle? What is that? Well, it, it effectively means recession, inflation, and policy risks. These are the three risks that we currently have. And what's very, very unique about this cycle is that recession risks and inflation risks are at odds with each other with respect to policy, meaning that when the Fed has to address recession risks, which I think is what we're in right now, what will effectively what we have to see is easier policy. But at the same time, if inflation's a problem, then they probably also have to address that risk too, which also means for tighter policy. So these both 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 of these policy actions that would that would that are required to address the current problems that we have today are at odds with each other. And I think that's what's creating a lot of the confusion and a lot of the volatility in, in the markets. So, you know, as, as many people have been saying, the Fed is trying to bring down inflation. That is certainly what they're trying to do. And yes, I think they can bring inflation down to two and a half or even three percent. The question, though, is can they keep it there? Will a policy rate move up towards three and a half, possibly even 3.75 percent? Will that be enough to keep inflation at their target or do they have to do more? And I think that's what the markets are essentially sensing as, as a risk much further down the road. Jim, let's frame it around an index, a Bloomberg Total Return Index, obviously the old Lehman Index and Barclays owned it for a while. Uh, the corporate index total return down 15 percent. That's a horrific bear market once in a lifetime for any of our listeners and viewers. We've had a bounce. Do you just assume we go through and breach on price those new lows of June? Do we go through and have even greater losses in price in debt? So, so this is this is a really good question, Tom, and this is what should be keeping people up at night because effectively, what's what's happened is that a lot of the losses that we've seen within credit have light it has really been because interest rates have risen. It, it really hasn't been because spreads have widened a lot. Yes, spreads have widened, but but spreads are not at a level right now that are are ringing alarm bells. They're certainly a little bit wider, but but certainly it's been the rates market that has actually created these losses. So, if we do go into downturn and this is this is the risk if we do go into a downturn something more of a of a deeper slowdown potentially a recession something along the, those lines then that means default risks will start to rise and that will widen spreads even more and that will actually add to the losses of some of these products but so far with the narrative is, is that if we have a recession maybe we're in one right now who knows um, if we have one though that essentially what we see is, is, a, is a very mild recession because the jobs market is still very, very strong and consumption will still be there. So that means default risks don't necessarily rise as much and that keeps spread product and that keeps credit uh, relatively well contained. So this is also something that's concerning for the markets. I'd love your take, Jim, on the Jan Hatzias view of the Fed holding uh, interest rates at three and a half, three point seven five percent for years. How does that change your default outlook over the next couple of years? So, so, so I think I think it's very interesting, right? Because when I think about what the Fed has told us, basically since the June meeting that they had, which is that they expect the policy rate to go to about three point seven five percent. They reiterated that in July. Powell said that the best outlook for the, for the future policy is what we said back in June. I think he's going to say that again on Friday. It's going to be, I think, it's not that the Fed is being more hawkish. They're just being very consistent to the messaging that they had back in June. Now, I, I, I tend to agree with what Jan is saying. Essentially, if we get to that 3.5%, 3.75% level, it doesn't make any sense that once they have inflation on the run to turn around and then just go the other way. They've got to have policy that's going to keep 
inflation at their target. Not just bring it down momentarily and then have it rise back up. That's not victory. Victory is getting inflation to target and keeping it there. So it could mean that the Fed does keep policy rates as high as 35 to 3.75% for a more extended period of time. That's why the bond yields are, are rising in the back end and, and the curve is starting to re-steepen or disinvert to some degree. Jim, awesome to hear from you, sir, to kick off our coverage this morning before we head out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Jim Karen there of Morgan Stanley Investment <clears throat> Management. Just to reflect on some of the data we've had so far this week, the PMIs from S&P Global in the United States yesterday, the team here at Bloomberg breaking this down. If you strip out the pandemic, that's the worst read we've had on that number, Lisa, going all the way back in data back to 2009. It was that dreadful. Will it be confirmed by the ISM? Because there's been a little bit of a divergence between those two things over the last month or so. It will be fascinating, but I was surprised by how well we shook it off. Yeah. given how bad it was. Especially because it's not just the manufacturing side, which we kind of had have had a sense about for a while. It was also the services side, even though we're not necessarily getting the headwind from new COVID uh, rounds in the United States. So what explains that if you're not seeing people go to as many uh, restaurants and go to as many uh, amusement parks as they previously did? Is this more evidence of the consumer being crimped and reducing discretionary spending? You know who's going to help out the hospitality business? over the next couple of days, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. I think he's sitting over there. He's going to be a very, very busy man, aren't you, Tom? It is, it's interesting to see. Like, right now, 46 degrees. John, we quote centigrade <laughs> here for you in Jackson Hole. Thank you. Eight degrees centigrade okay. right now. I'm, I'm familiar with those it's numbers. It's actually pretty warm. Thank you. He's and, John, what's important there. here nice is, you know, where do we go? I think we got to go to Eleanor's, a wonderful little pub behind a liquor store. Ready to go. In Jackson. And it's we can watch part of Midlothian play Zurich. There. Okay, Tom. Do, do, you, do you go to the liquor store before Soccer. you go to the bar, or do you no, go to you the go liquor to store? No, you go to the liquor afterwards? store, and the bar is through a door in the back. That's how exclusive oh, Eleanor's is. Are you there. serious? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm checking out. And Hardin Midlothian. I mean, I think they they look good against Zurich. Okay. Surveillance after hours available on Twitter <laughs> in the middle of the night, maybe. <laughs> Check it out before it gets deleted. <laughs> Futures unchanged on the S and P from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says it's very clear that the central bank needs to tighten monetary policy. In a speech, Kashkari said U.S. inflation is very high and the Fed should relax only when there's evidence that it's on the way back down to 2%. U.S. consumer prices rose 8.5% in the 12 months through July. It is the sixth month anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the war has appended fundamental assumptions about Russia's military and economy. Analysts have been surprised that Moscow's much larger and better equipped army did not quickly dominate Ukrainian forces. On the other hand, Russia's economy is holding up better than expected despite sanctions imposed by the West. Japan is planning a dramatic shift back to nuclear power more than a decade after the Fukushima disaster. That includes restarting a number of shutdown reactors and developing new plants using next generation technologies. Japan is trying to avoid more strains on power grids that are buckled under heavy demand this summer. Today, President Biden will make his long-awaited announcement on student debt relief. Some of his allies are likely to be disappointed. The president has been considering forgiving $10,000 per borrower in student debt, whilst capping the relief at incomes of $125,000 to $150,000. Advocates say the debt forgiveness limit should be higher to help black or lower-income students. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. With inflation this high, I'm for me, I'm in the mode of we need to err on making sure we're getting inflation down and only relax when we see compelling evidence that inflation is well on its way back down to 2%. The Federal Reserve turned upside down. Neil Kashkari sounding very hawkish and somehow Esther George of the Kansas City Fed sounding somehow dovish. Lisa, does that make sense to you? I mean, unless you think that, you know, one is down. being extreme on all ends, depending on the moment, and the extreme is so not hawkish. Role reversal yeah. I mean, it's just between the dumps and the hawks. Hard to...
get your hand around. With Tom Keane and Lisa Bramage, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Can you down to that big speech in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, with Chairman Powell later this week, 10 a.m. Eastern time on Friday. Futures right now negative 0.05 percent on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, down by 0.06 percent. No big changes here. Yields down by almost the basis point to 3.0387 percent. Tom, we've talked about it a million times, haven't we? In the FX market, euro dollar 99.43 negative. Let's call it a little oh. more than a quarter of one percent. You, st you and I are still not used to the parity watch. 0 0.99 is not 1.01. John, I do want to point out Brent crude above $100 a barrel. Uh, in a quiet day, there's some little noises being made, and particularly... Yeah, good catch, Tom. OPEC Plus and the Saudis yeah. pushing back against yeah. the price that they thought was a little bit too low. And 94, let's call it 94.50 on WTI as well. Right now in the politics of the moment, and if you're confused about Jackson Hole, you'll be ever more confused about this argument this debate of forgiveness of student loans. Anne-Marie Horton is an expert on this. She has studied and studied it. And what fascinates me, Anne-Marie Horton, is I don't know what the president's view is. I read an article. I read another one. I got all these people jockeying around, and it seems to me nobody actually knows what the president of the United States believes in. What's he believe in? Well, he campaigned on getting rid of pretty much all of it for a number of individuals that are making less than $125,000. But part of the reason why the White House has really played their cards very close when it comes to this, which we've been expecting for months, is because there is really two big dividing camps about how to approach student <clears throat> debt lo um, loan forgiveness. You have progressives, you have the NAACP, talking about the fact that it should be up to $50,000 with the White House likely coming out today to forgive $10,000 with a cap of $125,000 to $150,000 for those individuals, uh, what they're bringing home in their income. And then you have on the other side of the coin, especially when it comes to extending the moratorium on paying down your debt, the likes of Larry Summers, who's saying this is the worst idea the administration can enact. And this comes at a very difficult time because, one, the Biden administration wants to make sure they are especially getting out the youth vote ahead of the midterm elections. And yeah. I can tell you from experience, those individuals once a week at least are on the corner of Pennsylvania Avenue talking about and protesting the student <clears throat> loan issue. But at the same time, they're dealing with very high inflation. And that is why uh, former Treasury Secretary Summers says this could add to that yeah. inflationary pressure. Well, $10,000 on, let's take New York University, is most expensive school on the planet, $77,632 per year all in. Maybe there's something more. I don't know what it is. But, but the bottom line, Anne-Marie, is they've been pushed aside. This is undergraduate. And some people are saying even only state colleges would be involved as well. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a funnel of hope. And am I right? It's just been narrowed down to next to nothing? Yeah, it continues, continuously gets narrowed down. But they're giving a little bit of breathing room by trying to extend this moratorium. One of the big issues when you look at student debt loan forgiveness and some of the data behind it, and it is a credibly sad statistic but very hard to target, is that – if you look at individuals who complete four years bachelor degrees, there's actually millions out there who have not had finished their college degree and so are not making and not benefiting from the benefits you have in terms of pay and job and career uh, progression you would have if you had that college degree are paying student loans without it. And that is a large majority. And then, of course, there's the racial divide. And by and large, individuals who get hit the worst on this are black students. Well, John, help me out here. The University of Warwick, just to pick a random school in England, all in is 32,000 U.S. dollars per year versus the idiocy in America. John, translate oh, well, maybe this for an for international me. student, domestic students, Tom, I think it's 9,000 sterling per year annually for tuition. John, you must think we're nuts. Well, when I started college, Tom, it was closer to 1,000. Can you imagine? No, I can't. No, sterling. John, I cannot imagine that. Yeah. I think, as Anne-Marie pointed out, Tom, the more I've spent, the more time I've spent looking at this, the more complicated I realize it is. And Anne-Marie's gone through some of the statistics. The number one statistic, though, MH, that will always get thrown around and that this administration will struggle to hide from is the growing earnings gap between young college graduates and their counterparts without degrees. Pew Research mm -hmm. have broken that down again this year. They often do that. 
What do they say back to that? It's very, it's very difficult because those without, are you saying those without those college degrees but had spent some time in college, uh, it's very difficult to target those versus those who say, I went through, I spent all this money on the college degrees, I'm now getting paid but I still owe a ton of debt. Um, maybe they're making above $150,000 but living in very expensive cities like New York or Los Angeles and they're dealing with inflation. Should they be not exempt from this or not? It's a difficult one for the administration, which is why the administration has been playing their cards incredibly close. And also, they've really dragged their feet in coming out with a statement on this, which we're expecting today. AMH, looking forward to your coverage through today. Anne-Marie, down in Washington, D.C. Lisa, policy is really complex. You'll hear the Republican talking points today. You'll hear the talking points from the administration, too. But policy, ultimately, is very complex. And... Lisa, I know that you, like me, the more time you spend looking at this, the more complex you realize things are. Especially with the timing. Why now? Especially if we're worried about inflation. Why come out with a new relief program? Especially at a time when the labor force participation rate among people from the ages of 16 to 24 has fallen. Even though people are not getting back into the labor market, you do wonder why now? It does seem like this is something that could be addressed in many different ways. The timing, however, especially when you are going on a platform of trying to reduce inflation, creates a lot of questions. Tom's touched on the heart of the problem, though. In college in America, Tom, it's just oh, don't get me going. Too expensive, John. It's just you know, too expensive. You know, and what I, we're ultimately doing is subsidizing the colleges here, I, I was and we talk, need to do something about that. John, I was talking with Al from New Jersey about this the other day, and and the bottom line is, he said, if I bring this up on air, I will. He's upset about it too, Tom. I think retired. a lot of people are upset about it. John, John, let me let me speak air? around the bush. <laughs> I don't want to be too frank. Sure. It's a total freaking scam. Okay, okay. tell us what you really think. <laughs> Features unchanged on the S&P 500 from Put New York. Put the puck in the net, full ride. With Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. Three days of losses on the S&P 500. Some small losses this morning. I don't even know if you can call them that. We're basically unchanged on the S&P. Futures negative 0.02%. On the Nasdaq, we're down about 0.05. I think we all noticed yesterday, energy equities making a bit of a comeback. Crude, back through 100, as Tom mentioned, on Brent. And getting close to 95. Pushing those kind of levels into the 90s again <clears> on WTI. That's the equity picture. Here's the bond market story. We're very focused on the front end of the yield curve going into Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and that Chairman Powell speech. Just hanging out in and around 330. Yields unchanged today at 329.68. Just watch how the 10 year responds to incoming data, though. Just north of 3% right now. The PMIs yesterday, dreadful. We'll talk to Andrew Hollenhorst, the city, in just a moment on why he thinks we can still get Fed funds to 4% despite <coughs> some of the incoming information. One to finish on foreign exchange, Tom, and get used to these levels because I'm still not used to these levels. 99.36 on euro dollar, cable sterling against the US dollar, 117.85, Tom, a break of 118 this week. Yeah, what I would look at, John, is I'd go Pacific Rim here, dollar, yeah, uh, renminbi rather. Uh, the Chinese yuan is really buttressed up against new weakness. I think that bears watching into the weekend and, of course, their Monday opening, our Sunday evening. And the thing that hasn't moved, John, as we mentioned yesterday, is dollar yen. And at a 136 level, you need to get out 139.40, weaker yen, and we're not there yet. DXY stronger today, Tom. Of course, a heavy lean towards the single currency for that particular one. But levels we haven't seen since 2002, just a couple of days ago. So it gives you an idea yeah. of the kind of strength we're seeing for the greenback this week. We're committed at Surveillance to talking about economics. That has always been our lead story. And as we prepare for Jackson Hole, we are bringing you the voices now. Jan Hoskius of Goldman Sachs with us yesterday. Steve Rusciuto was lights out from Mizuho. And of course, when we are at Jackson Hole, we're gonna have world-class coverage, including voices from Europe. Right now, a guy's out front. This is like Bob Dylan picking up an electric guitar at Newport a few years ago. Andrew Hollenhorst at Citigroup had the courage to come out early and say, higher rates. And everybody said, you're nuts. Now he's not nuts. Oh. Everybody's joined the party. Reaffirm for us, Andrew Hollenhorst, where Mr. Powell's going right now. Give us that level that we will see next year. I think we're going to be at 4% or above. And 
really Tom, the call is really more about inflation than it is about rates. I think <laughs> rates are following where inflation is going and where inflation has been. Um, we're sitting at eight, nine percent inflation. I think there's underlying core measures of inflation that look like maybe somewhere between four and six percent. When you're at those kind of levels of inflation, it's hard to think the policy rates aren't going to get up to around four percent or even above. Your colleagues in London quoted 18 percent on United Kingdom energy affected inflation. I know we're not going to get something inflammatory like that. But is your headline to Jackson Hole that we will be surprised how difficult it is to drop inflation down? So I think there are elements of inflation where we might see some relief. We've seen commodity prices move lower. Maybe we'll get some relief in goods prices. But the core issue for the U.S. economy, tightness in the housing market, which is maybe being relieved by higher mortgage rates, but tightness in labor markets. And that's what I keep coming back to. So you look at these core measures of underlying inflation that are running 4 to 6 percent. Then you look at underlying wage growth, employment cost index, Atlanta Fed wage tracker, really however you want to look at it, we're seeing wage growth 5% plus. And I think that that's really the issue for the Fed. It's a very, very tight domestic labor market, a lot of inflationary pressure. And I think we know from history that that does prove difficult to bring down. And you usually need a significant tightening of financial conditions to loosen the labor market and bring inflationary pressure down. Andrew, just tell me the balance of risks around your view. 75 in September, 4% on Fed funds by year end. Tilted to the downside, tilted to the upside, fairly balanced. How's that change developed in the last month? So we keep coming back to this and we keep trying to reassess, you know, what, at what point will we see more downside than upside risk to policy rates? And the answer we keep coming back with is that there's still more upside I think at the September FOMC meeting, we have had some mixed data, um, some data on the activity side that looks pretty reassuring. If you look at, for instance, 528,000 new jobs that were created, um, but some data that have been uneven. So I think it's very hard to call an individual meeting. We do think they'll go 75 basis points in September. I think that the easier call or the higher conviction call is where do they need to get to eventually? How high do they need to get? And how long do they need to stay there? And I think they're the risk, especially relative to the market, are very much to the upside. Remember, this is a market that is still pricing in interest rate cuts in 2023, with the Fed only getting up to a level maybe around three and a half, 375 basis points. I think the risks are definitely that the Fed goes further than that and then maintains rates at a higher level for longer than that. Analysts have been pushing back against this idea, Andrew, a little bit more, especially as they point to certain disinflationary aspects, like, uh, for example, used car uh, sales or the inventories at retailers and the markdowns that they're planning for fall. There are all of these forces that are leading people to ratchet down how high they see inflation ending the year. Why do you disagree? Why are you pushing back against that narrative? So I, I think maybe we need some new definitions of core inflation. And those are actually out there. If you look at the Atlanta Fed, they have a great dashboard of various metrics, trimmed mean inflation, sticky price inflation, various flavors of core inflation. One thing that those various flavors of core inflation would do is look at something like used car prices and say something very specific and very different is going on with used car prices. There was a very particular issue with a shortage of semiconductors that pushed up used car prices very significantly. They're still extremely high, they're still elevated. So you know, we're talking about changes in prices, they're coming down from very high levels. Um, so yes, that's part of why we saw a weaker core inflation print in the month of July. We may have a similar print in August. If you look at the wholesale used car prices, they've come down again. Um, so that might end up coming through in the August core inflation print. But I think, you know, if you listen to Minneapolis Fed President Kashkari last night, for instance, used to be one of the biggest doves amongst Fed officials. Now one of the biggest hawks. What is he doing? He's looking through those kind of one-time specific elements um, that probably don't tell us a lot about the underlying inflationary trend, um, which is around 4 to 6 percent. And again, it's, it really comes back to the tight labor market, costs that service providers in particular have to pass on uh, to their customers. And so that acceleration that we've seen in wages 
you'll probably see that showing up in prices. So we could actually accelerate in some components of inflation, even if, let's say, used car prices are coming down. Okay, even with that, though, a lot of uh, analysts are saying, isn't it more likely that the Fed will raise rates to three and a half percent, three and three quarters percent, and then hold it there for a while? Be patient, wait for some of this tightening to trickle out. Why do you think that they will be unable to do that? Or do you think it's just sort of political pressure that if inflation remains high, they will have to appear to be taking a harder line? I don't think it's political pressure, Lisa. I really think it's fundamental economics, basic monetary theory, the idea that you need to get real interest rates, by which I mean the nominal interest rate minus some measure of underlying inflation back to a level that's at least positive. I think that's probably the minimum that you need to get to, to have enough restraint in the economy to bring inflation down. Um, there are theoretical models that kind of suggest that, uh, but there's also just the empirical fact, the history on this, that typically you need to get that nominal policy rate up to the rate of inflation. So if you stop at three and a half percent in a world where inflation is running four percent, five percent, six percent, and on a headline basis, we've been, you know, eight, nine percent, that means you're at a very significantly negative real rate of interest. Um, and that's just really important because you are not going to slow down the economy, cool an overheating economy. Uh, by showing that economy, showing individuals, showing firms a negative real rate of interest. So 3.5% potentially, if inflation comes down a lot faster than expected, for exogenous reasons, maybe they could end up there. Um, but I think the more likely scenario is that inflation proves persistent. The Fed has to do the work of bringing it down, which means those policy rates need to move above 4%. Andrew, I've got to squeeze this in. We'll catch up with a ton of Fed officials at the end of the week. What would you like us to ask them? What are you focused on that you really think needs to be answered? What, what I would love to hear, John, especially after the July FOMC meeting, is some clarification of how Fed officials think about the neutral rate of interest. It's what we were just talking about with Lisa. Where do you need to get rates to to have zero effect on inflation? And then how much further do you think you need to move rates to actually bring down inflation? Now, we see some of that in their summary of economic projections. But we've also heard from Chair Powell the kind of confusing, perplexing statement that maybe policy rates are in a range of neutral now. I think it's hard to defend that position in a world where inflation is running much stronger. So I'd really like to hear more clarity around that issue. You're not alone. Andrew Hollenhorst, thank you, sir, as always, from City. Lisa, he's not alone because Larry Summers has pushed back against that on Wall Street Week with David Weston. We've caught up with Mohammed al Arian, who said the same thing. And then other people will say, you know what, yes, uh, inflation is high, but it's going to come down pretty dramatically. The two camps are getting more entrenched, and it's hard to know what data is actually going to change them. I really want to see the research that they present at this uh, Jackson Hole Symposium. Where do they come out on the supply chain disruptions and how that's really distorted a whole host of the information that we're getting? Speaking of disruptions, the Italian Prime Minister speaking right now in Italy, Tom. Here's some headlines for you. Italy must never again be dependent on Russian gas. Not a surprise to read that. They can cut Russian gas imports to zero from the fall of 2024. Tom, did you hear what the Belgian Prime Minister said recently? So, give me that. I never mind that. a single winter. He was talking about maybe five. Yes, Perhaps even yes. ten winters of this. This, is in the this could go on yeah. for a long time. This is in the zeitgeist. And of course, we heard that from Jan Hatzius yesterday on inflation trend. And John, that's my core theme of the x-axis here, which is something Mr. Draghi knows well. Some would say he invented the new rhetoric of the x-axis. I'm not going to mince words, John. Mario Draghi will be missed at this Jackson Hole. A TK, I agree with you. It'd be nice to catch up with him, wouldn't it? I, I just think he's got over. a huge value add, given the mouthiness I see on, you know, this whole forward guidance data dependency thing. Well, he was, he was the king of that stuff, Tom. Yeah, but he had clarity and intensity and... <laughs> yeah, but he, he, style. He, he, did <laughs> he did it better. He did it better. He did it better. Swagger. He had Italian style, is that what exactly. you're trying to say? Of well, course. No, no I agree. Reason. Future's down. No. Ten to one percent. John, I said okay. that. No, you said that. Yeah. No. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The U.S. will mark Ukraine's Independence Day today by giving the country another $3 billion in weapons. It's also the six-month anniversary of the Russian invasion. U.S. diplomats have warned that Russia is preparing attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure and government facilities in coming days. 
In the UK, the favourite to be the next Prime Minister has hinted at an emergency cost of living boost for the elderly. Liz Truss wouldn't go into detail about how she would help households facing soaring energy bills, but she suggested the assistance would go to those on fixed incomes such as pensioners. Meanwhile, about one in six American homes, 20 million households that is, have fallen behind on their utility bills and face the possibility of a shut up. According to the National Energy Assistance Directors Association, it's the worst crisis the group has ever documented. There's been a big surge in electricity prices propelled by the soaring cost of natural gas. China is signaling an expansion of the government's crackdown on misconduct that has so far centered on the financial and tech centers. The government is now investigating a number of executives at state-owned real estate companies. The property sector is already dealing with a crippling slowdown that's hurting the world's second largest economy. And shares of Nordstrom are falling. The department store chain cut its outlook for profit and sales. Nordstrom said business has slowed as it as it off-price rack business with both demand and traffic tapering off in July. Investors had seen Nordstrom as insulated by its affluent customer base. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The market is betting that we are going to be short gas throughout this entire winter. Spreads are telling us the market is short uh, product, winter product, and hence higher bills this winter. That was Stephen Shork, the president of the Shork Group from New York City this morning. Good morning, Tom Keane, at least Ramitz and Jonathan Farrell. I get my words out. Futures okay, unchanged John, on the s and <laughs> on the Nasdaq. <laughs> down 11, down a tenth and 1%. Need a drink. Yields unchanged. 3.0462%, a TK style drink. That's crude 94.42, you know what I mean? Up uh, seven tenths of 1% <laughs> on crude. 94, and let's call it 40 cents, Tom. Brent through 100. Brent crude $100 and almost 101, up by seven tenths of 1%, Tom. After we do the show tomorrow, John, you know, we're going to have to go over to the Pioneer Grill, which is, is sort, right? of, sort of 1950s thing. And, you know, you're going to have to have a full Wyoming. And a full Wyoming is something with stuff on top of it. The, the major thing... Do you like want to share what the stuff is? A, it's like grits or whatever. Okay. A creamy, you know, like, like Cracker Barrel kind of thing. Okay. Le Barrel de Crack. It's a wonderful French restaurant. John, and it's like the Country Benedict. And that's good. They have huckleberry pancakes. And I'm sure they can do... I don't know what their mimosa is. Who's it responsible may... for supervising you on this trip? Um, it's not me this year. No, well, who's, who's doing this? Who's looking after you? Rachel from Purdue is usually She's the one not that here. does that, but you know, she, she called me up and said, "I just don't think so." You're on your own this time, Tom. Yeah, well, you know. See we'll if you make see. it Thursday morning. Right now, let us migrate on a really interesting day, and again with oil, 100.87 on Brent crude, to a gentleman with wonderful experience on sell side oil. Jacques Rousseau is with Clearview Energy Partners, a different remit right now, and he's someone with just huge experience. And Jacques, I want to go back to your work on refining. This is something we really haven't addressed. Lisa and John want to take a different tack. But right now we've got massive not in my backyard on refining. You wrote about this years ago. What do we do about not in my backyard if we need to take distillates to make stuff that we can use? Well, I guess the interesting part has been that um, since the pandemic, you've seen about 3 million barrels per day of, of global capacity closed down. And so that has uh, really impacted the market in total. Uh, within the United States, we, we can still make a lot of product, uh, but it's, it's needed outside the United States. So that's why refined product exports have been very high, too. I look at where we are, and like to take Jerry Nadler, who just won a big election on the Upper West Side, if we were to put a wind farm or whatever, you know, oil refinery or whatever off the Upper West Side in the Hudson River, that wouldn't go because I'm not in my backyard. Do we need to see a change to jumpstart refining to bring the price of oil down? Um, it's it's a great question, and I think we've seen it both in the downstream and midstream, where it's it's very hard to get a lot of things built um, outside. If you're if you're in Texas or Louisiana, those are the two places that you've got a better shot at, at getting some assets built. So I, I think that's the uh, the spot that should be looked at. 
Given the uh, demand that has increased dramatically, not just from the United States, but globally, in the wake of the disruption with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, are investors getting more accepting of the idea of greater shale investment? And I say this is profitability in that region in the U.S. is skyrocketing. Uh, that, that's a really good point because we, we haven't seen that yet. And I think that is kind of one of the key factors uh, both within the shale and globally, that energy investment is still well below where it was, you know, 10 years ago. And so that's something that does not appear to be coming back and, and is limiting supply growth. So uh, a high area of concern for sure. What's behind that, Jack? Is it the idea that perhaps this is going to be short-lived in terms of the demand surge, or is this just simply because the investment dollars are not there in the same way due to different ESG constraints and, and different kinds of uh, a feel among a lot of the endowments and, and uh, other institutional investors? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. You've definitely touched on one of the key points in terms of uh, the investor appetite. Um, so I, I just think, too, that, you know, there's a lot of labor shortages. So even if companies did want to put more rigs to work, they're, they're not people to do it. What about the natural gas space in the United States? Uh, there's been a bunch of fluctuation in response to the Freeport liquefied natural gas exporting center that was shut down. Uh, that actually gave a reprieve to gas prices in the U.S. because not as much was being exported to Europe. It's supposed to come back online this fall. How significant of a player can the U.S. be in staving off some of the deficits that we're seeing over in Europe to replace what we're seeing from Russia? Um, what we've seen is that uh, the, the U.S. is one of the major growth areas for liquefaction capacity. But, but the issue is that it takes a lot of time. And, and so within the U.S. And, and outside the U.S., there's really not much new capacity that's getting built. And this goes right back to your prior point about investment. So when investment dried up during the pandemic, it basically slowed down a lot of this new LNG capacity. Jacques Rousseau, Jacques, it's good to hear from you. Thank you, sir, of Clearview Energy Partners. I've been distracted by Cracker Barrel, Tom, this restaurant you're trying to take me to. <clears throat> cheesecake pancake breakfast, classic pancakes with a creamy cheesecake filling and fresh strawberries served with eggs and breakfast meat. Oh, I've man. got no idea what breakfast meat is. And Lisa, this is what John. they serve with it. Crisp and refreshing. Now serving Jack Daniels Country Cocktail <laughs> Southern <laughs> Pitch. <laughs> <laughs> is that breakfast? John, is that well, breakfast? Yeah, first of all, this is not is. the Pioneer Grill, which is fine cuisine and yeah, at the lodge me. at Jackson Hole. But, uh, John, you know, what's, what's great about the road tour you and I could take across the spine of Virginia down to Nashville is La Belle de Crack is just is a store. La Belle de Crack. And there's, okay. there's a store in the front, John, which you could decorate, you know, your, your, your walk up. But after that, John, at 2 a.m., you go to Shea Waff. Okay. And Shea Waff is, I'm sorry. We'll do the tour. I can't wait. I'm going to record all of this. Shea Waff is just like, you know, it makes Denny's I've look heard from like Rachel from well. Purdue, and she is so happy she's not with us this year, Tom. Oh, good. That's good to know. <laughs> this headline just crossed from the ECB rates pricing in markets right now. I'll get to it for you. Traders pricing one point of ECB hikes by October for the first yeah, time. Yeah, translate that. What's interesting about this, so that's 100 basis points of extra hikes from the ECB. What's interesting about this is the euro's weaker. It's not stronger. Euro dollar 99.19, we're negative a half of 1%. So we're pricing in more hikes, Tom, and yet we're not really getting any traction with a stronger euro whatsoever. Well, this goes down to inflation-adjusted analysis. And, John, I mean, we haven't talked about it in ages, but the real yield, you'll see that, folks, in Jackson Hole. That'll be at noon really? mountain time. Um, the 10-year the real yield is a 0 0.45 positive. That's not enough oomph, John, to get this done. I mean, this is the whole debate of, say, Alarion and the others. We need more oomph to really shift this. Do you think oomph gets it done? I, I've no idea if it does or whether this FX market is now My just exclusively opinion? focused on, on growth and not inflation. I'm doubtful oomph gets it done because it is a modern, vastly open economy. What I'm much more interested in, and I'm not sure this will be addressed, John, at Jackson Hole, is two Americas. So Hatsius alluded to that. Steve Rusciuto alluded to that as well yesterday. Would you like to translate oomph, Lisa? Oomph? Yeah, sure. Do you, do you want to take that one? Sure. <clears throat> it means... Oomph. No. Oomph. It means oomph. It stands on its own. You know, basically, Can you how much. If you it... accidentally tuned in this morning. <laughs> I apologize to whoever it is. What are they talking about? <laughs> well, I'm talking about this being really the ultimate point, which is how much power do rate hikes have in this modern environment? And that's one of the key themes of this Jackson Hole Symposium. The future's negative five on the SP 500. We are down about a tenth of 1% with Tom Keat.
and Lisa Bramford, some Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Oomph. Oomph. For now. Oomph. <laughs> Stay tuned if you're confused and this is your first time. There's more to come. <laughs> What's going to be sustained is the focus on trying to squeeze out inflation to the extent the Fed can. Underneath it all is shortages in housing, shortages in labor globally. You can't kind of overestimate the vulnerability of the economy in corporate America. There's no victory declared here from the Federal Reserve. I just want to be clear. They will continue to tighten. There is a broader global story that the market is panicking about what Fed Chair Powell will say at Jackson Hole. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Special coverage this week, TK on Real Yield on Wall Street Week. Extended coverage through the weekend <laughs> from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Live from New York City this morning. I can't keep a straight face. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the NASDAQ, we're down about two tenths of 1%. TK before today, three days of losses. Well, three days of losses and a little bit of a snooze fest today, John. I don't want to overplay it with oil above $100 a barrel, but we're waiting. And the question, John, is what are we waiting for? Our most important conversation today will be Thomas Purcelli, RBC Capital Markets. He cut his teeth on wage inflation, and that's what's not going to be talked about at Jackson Hole. The labor economy, the job economy, and the fear of inflation seeping into a, something like the 70s. Tom, this is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for Chairman Powell on Friday. We're waiting for a payrolls report on September 2nd. We're waiting for a CPI report on September 13th. And then we're waiting, Tom, for a meeting on September 21. And the road to September 21, Tom, is still a long one. Do we get forward guidance? And to me, that's what's going to be fascinating. I, there's a lot of different opinions about what we're going to hear. I'm going to listen to Michael McKee more than anyone, but John, to me, what's so important is what he doesn't say. One thing he's not going to address is the international economy. It's ugly in Europe. Elisa, is he going to address this market given what's happening abroad? Does he feel comfortable with the market given how much it's rallied? Yes, we've seen it soften a little bit, but still hanging in there. Is this okay for him? Is he going to still go back to the line that we heard last month that even though the market has rallied, it still is well below some of the highs? Is that enough to get it done? Or do we need something much more hawkish to even keep things where they are because people are expecting hawkishness from this Fed? Before we get to this Fed decision, we've got to get to the ECB decision on September 8th. We're looking for another 50 basis points and maybe after that another 50 basis points and yet Lisa this euro is weaker it's not stronger yeah and a lot of people saying even a one percentage point increase in European rates is not enough to strengthen this euro which really raises the theme of what we're going to hear at Jackson Hole has monetary <laughs> policy lost its potency in an era of supply chain disruptions has it reached its limits mm. and how does the European project deal with that at a time when inflation oh. is becoming a spiral with the importation of it through a weaker year smartest essay I've seen so far. Ambrose Evans Pritchard in The Telegraph today. There'll be many others writing for Bloomberg. Sir Howard Davies writing in uh, The Guardian I thought was brilliant. He will join us on Friday. We're th I'm thrilled about that, John, particularly with Governor Bailey attending uh, Jackson Hole. John, tomorrow, 7.20 a.m., we are thrilled to bring seven feet tall Grizzly 399 from 399 Jackson Hole. 399 is dangerous. We'll be there. 399 wants more to hike a ton. This is I, I'm, I'm told that she's fully integrated into society now. Just hold on a second. Can this I just is... say, John's not kidding. He's not going to let us eat on set because he's worried about bears. The bears are going to be uh, fine. Lisa, I agree with John. Oh, come it's not there funny go. out oh, there. No just food. from the berry bushes. No huckleberry be pancakes no food for you. between bites. <laughs> no food for you. Go to Lisa. You know. Can I put milk then in my coffee, We'll take you please. to Cracker Barrel after... The opening okay, John, true right. story. John, true story. There's <laughs> doors where they go into the panel. I don't even want to go in because I just fall asleep. McKee goes in. Kathleen Hayes goes in. What are we talking the about? The doors burst open, and out comes Willem Bowder. And there's a photograph of Willem Bowder before he was at Citigroup, and he's furious about whatever the debate was. And next to him is the acclaimed six and a half foot, seven foot grizzly bear in a glass cage, which is in the lobby at Jackson Hall. Very famous photo. But we will have live grizzly 
only three nine nine. Look for that tomorrow. A very famous photo that none of us have seen. So I look forward to seeing it, Tom. <laughs> Features down by two points on the S and P five hundred. He's so upset with that. We're down by around about a tenth of one percent on the Nasdaq. We're down by fourteen points. We're down by a little more than a tenth of one percent. Yields unchanged at three point zero four six two percent on a ten year. In the FX market, euro weaker by a half of one percent. Euro dollar Lisa ninety nine twenty four. Yeah, I'm definitely keeping my eye on that. I'll whip through this so that we can talk more about grizzly bears today. We get July durable goods orders at 8.30 a.m. as well as July pending home sales at 10 a.m. How much do we see an ongoing softening in the home sales activity, especially because we've seen levels that we have not seen since the financial crisis two decades ago or uh, 15 years ago? How much does this portend price declines and how much is this just simply a softening in activity in the wake of some of the increases that we've seen in mortgages? 1 p.m. The Treasury will sell $45 billion of five-year notes. This comes after yesterday. Today's two-year auction, which did not go so well, it was actually one of the worst that we've seen in the past four years. How much is that repeated in the five-year note, especially given the push and pull over how long the Fed will have to keep rates high in order to fight inflation? And today, a very controversial program. President Biden is expected to detail what his plan is for student debt relief. How much do they actually get for relieving uh, $10,000 for certain eligible individuals. How do they roll this out at a time of disagreement within their own party and concerns about inflation, John? And complex and sometimes controversial. Another big policy effort down in D.C. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie in about 10 minutes' time. I want to catch up with Laurie Heinel now, Global CIO at State Street Global Advisors. Laurie, I've got to say this. We've been building up Jackson Hole and Chairman Powell's speech so much. I wonder if it's a snooze like in many ways it was 12 months ago. Very academic. Do you expect the same again? Well, we don't expect the same academic tone. Uh, clearly, last year, uh, the Fed was really off its mark. Uh, they thought that inflation was going to be transitory, and they seemed much more dovish against a backdrop that seemed increasingly inflationary. So this time around, they've got to be a bit more front-footed. They've got to address what's happening in the marketplace, focus on the data <clears> dependency, <throat> but also be very committed to the hawkish stance that they've already set forward. You know, I look at this, Lori, as a seesaw. And the seesaw here is the risk of a slowdown in growth, and maybe there's also in there as well dynamics of the labor economy. I mean, they're not the Fed is is debating inflation, but what we're worried about in Europe and here is a slowdown in economic growth in the labor economy. Do they give Chairman Powell support in this speech? Well, we're very concerned about that as well. And in fact, we think continuing to be super hawkish here is not the right posture because we already are starting to see some signs that the, the rate hikes have taken root. And you're seeing whether it's um, economic slowdown or whether it's interest rate sensitive sectors like housing already slowing down. But as you know, the labor markets have been persistently strong. So that gives the Fed cover to focus on the inflation headline numbers while not being too concerned about labor. But we think that that's a very dangerous posture right now. Lori, let's say Fed Chair Jay Powell comes out and says exactly what you just said. We don't want to go too far before seeing the ramifications of what we've already done. Does the market just rip? Is the rally just incredible and go completely against them? Well, it's going to be have to be a lot more than that, because the other concern here is that they can't be viewed as waffling too much. One of the great things about the, the, the Fed chairman's um, sort of history is that there has been a lot of credibility that they've been consistent to being data dependent. So they have to be very careful about seeming to ignore the data, especially the data they've said is the most important to them. But some type of, um, you know, just acknowledgement that while they still remain very hawkish and very focused on the short term pressures, that they are going to continue to watch for signs that some of their moves are starting to take root. So you just said something that I, I'm still just mulling over in my head. You said they've actually built up credibility about their data dependency. Have they? I mean, I think that there's a lot of questions around their credibility, which data they actually care about, and whether they're using the data points they want to to confirm uh, the message that they want to send out there. What's the counter argument to that? Well, look, I think I, I, I actually agree with you quite a lot. I'm, I'm talking about the early days of the Fed uh, posture and the fact that up until about a year ago, they seem to be able to track that very carefully. But as I noted, last year they got it wrong. And so now they're a little bit behind the curveball. And the question is, can they get back on sides? But they have to really navigate that carefully because it can't be seen as abandoning that sort of data dependency. Laurie Heinel, thank you. Of State Street Global Advisors setting us up for Chairman Powell later this week. 
Lisa, when you think about it, just really think about it. Inflation's at 8.5 percent. How can they be dovish with inflation at 8.5 percent? And the problem that the chairman's had is that every time he speaks over the last few months, every time we get a news conference with the chairman at the Federal Reserve decision, this market has decided that the turn's about to come. Somehow the pivot's just around the corner. Well, and honestly, though, the, it, pivot. The, we've, we've shed a lot of uh, sarcasm around the pivot that wasn't, right? That, that, that the Fed didn't really actually create a huge change in tone. However, they did recognize that perhaps uh, they have to wait a little bit longer and be prudent and not over-tighten uh, before they see the ramifications of their policy. And that in and of itself could be considered dovish given an 8.5% inflation rate. Yeah. So I think that that's the push-pull here. Uh, how do they not give nod to that but still seem like they're aware of all sides of the debate? Did you ever think you'd call Neil Kashkari, Tom, a hawk? No, I did not. The Fed. No, this is, tr this is important. He's been a, a good friend of the show and all that, but... Uh, John, I really never thought I'd see the shift we see. John, I have huge trouble with the word pivot, whether it was President Obama pivoting to the Pacific. Pivot is a marketing phrase. <laughs> it's an image phrase to describe a stochastic process where you've got mysterious abilities to make a turn at some point, whether it's the Red Sox baseball, the tots, whatever. And the answer is pivot is baloney. That's, you know, that, that's all there is to that's, it. That's it. Do you want to tell us what you really bologna, think about John, that? Bologna, John, is an American food meat. Okay. It's, it's, I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with bologna. I have no idea. No idea. Yeah. I'm familiar, Tom, though. I am familiar. Tom, it's a process. And it's a process the way you go from 75 maybe to 50 to 25 and you pause. And, Lisa, that's what a lot of people are still looking for. Wasn't it Jan Hassius yesterday of Goldman that said a shift down to 50 and then to 25 and then wait? Well, And then yeah. maybe you stop at 3.5% and you sit there for up to two years. Yeah, and then uh, we heard some pushback to that this morning, though, saying that perhaps uh, you had to go further. Andrew Hollenhorst saying people don't understand what the neutral rate is, and it is much higher than people currently expect. Baloney. It tastes good, Tom. Oh, uh, with olives and pimento, it's just awesome. What's going on this okay. morning? It, it's just great. The they have that at the Pioneer Grill, in. John, but we will not have that on set because of Grizz 399. I've got good news, Tom. Managed to change my <laughs> flights with United. Smaller layover. Did it on the cheap day of. Really? So guess who gets the babysitting? I, I, I'm all new at this. You know, I, I'm so, <laughs> you know, it's I'll carbon get to babysit. Thing. I'll be babysitting TK. Futures unchanged on the S&P. So the good news is Tom will arrive to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'm not responsible for him tonight. And I've got no idea if he shows up tomorrow morning. Okay? It's 50-50. From New York, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. It's the six-month anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the war has appended fundamental assumptions about Russia's military and economy. Analysts have been surprised that Moscow's much larger and better equipped army did not quickly dominate Ukrainian forces. On the other hand, Russia's economy is holding up better than expected, despite sanctions imposed by the West. In the June, for the first time on record, the UK imported no fuel from Russia. The British government achieved its ambition to phase out all purchases of natural gas and oil from Russia following the invasion of Ukraine. Russia had been the UK's largest supplier of refined oil. Meanwhile, the governor of the Bank of Thailand says it won't be influenced by the Fed to make large interest rate increase to fight inflation. Bloomberg spoke to Sethaput Suthivatna Rupert in Bangkok. Gradual meaning that we don't see the need to undertake aggressive rate hikes at each meeting because the economic circumstances and conditions in Thailand are different from those in the industrial countries. Measured means we'll calibrate our response to the economic conditions, so we'll be data-driven. The Bank of Thailand raised interest rates a quarter point this month for the first time since 2018. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think a year from now, or two years from now, inflation will be much lower because there are some, uh, you know, some some drivers. I mean, commodity prices are, are clear. The good sector in general, I do think that's going to come off a lot.
Absolute clinic with Jan Hatzius yesterday, the chief economist at Goldman Sachs. You can find that interview <clears throat> on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. From New York City this morning, good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures unchanged on the S&P after three days of losses. On the Nasdaq, we're down about five. We're pretty much unchanged there too. Equities doing OK. The bond market not doing much. 3.0517. Euro weaker again by a third of 1% at 99.35. And Tom, you're right. Stay focused on this. Crude's making a comeback. Close to 95 yeah. on WTI, 94.73 uh, by more than 1%. No, not that it means a lot, but I did a moving average study, and we're above one of the key moving averages, and we just slid upwards here quietly. And I just think it, you know, it bears watching. Again, a lot of that off news flow, including uh, the Iranian talks, which are uh, sporting um, as well. John, again, we've got a great lineup for Jackson Hole here. I was talking with Anne Marie Horton, and she said, well, you, you know, you, you, you've got to get to the heart and soul of Jackson Hole. And one of the things about the lodge is, is the famed grizzly bear, uh, which, you know, I mean, the thing is ginormous. Here's uh, transitory, the grizz on the left and uh, Chairman Bernanke on the right. There we go. Were you there for that one, Tom? I can't remember. I bet this is like my sixth one, I think. And, and I, I honestly I'm sure Mike McKee remember. was there. Oh, yeah. Mike, Mike owns this. Mike McKee and, did a great package about 10 years ago where he actually yeah. went around Jackson Hole and asked tourists if they knew what was yeah. happening up the road and but, if they'd ever heard of yeah. Chairman Ben Bernanke. And, uh, no. You know, Ben's going to be here. And they were like, mm, OK. Yeah. <laughs> What's important about this, and for those of you on radio, it's a, it's a acclaimed bear, the bowder bear in the glass cage, uh, dead. And Ben Bernanke, who I believe at the time was reported to be alive, and, 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 John, unfortunately, you're right about the bear danger. It's not funny. I it's, agree with you, TK. Like, you know, serious, I've been scaring serious. myself reading up on it, and oh, God, Lisa is, Lisa's it's winding stuff. me up. She thinks we're ridiculous, and well, the, Lisa's going hiking. The, the, the grizzlies, are, the, the grizzlies okay. are like moose. When you see them the first time, it's like, uh, it's not Disney. You know, it's not Disneyland. Speaking of Disneyland, Emory Horton is in Washington, which always is like... It's not uh, Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> is she still there? there to, Did she run away? Know, the Never Never Land of Washington. And what they're <laughs> focusing on, Emory, to cut to the chase, the Democrats are doing better. Is it just because of the Roe v. Wade debate, or is there something else going on? Yeah, a lot of Mickey Mouse sometimes down here, Tom. When you look at the races overnight and you're talking about Democrats doing better and maybe Roe v. Wade, you have to look at this 19th congressional district in New York, which Pat Ryan up was the Hudson able to River. pick. Yes, which Pat Ryan was able to pick up. And this is so important because this is a swing district. They vote for the former President Trump in 2016, and they voted for Biden. They've also voted for Bush, and they voted for Obama. So what happened with Pat Ryan was he focused squarely on abortion rights and Roe v. Wade. And what you had from his challenger is talking about some of these overarching issues Republicans are taking nationwide, which is inflation and crime. And it shows that the abortion issue between this swing uh, district, as well as what happened in Kansas a few weeks back, shows that this mm -hmm. could be a very much so live debate for the Democrats yeah. to really campaign on in November. We're out of step here, uh, Anne Marie. We've been watching Wild Kingdom getting John Farrell ready for the Grizz out in Wyoming. What's your single takeaway from the Tuesday primaries? We didn't have the drama of uh, Cheney of Wyoming as we did a week ago. No, I, one would be the Pat Ryan abortion is resonating in swing district voters. That is incredibly important okay. for Democrats to take away and also Republicans to know that this is something that they may to need to work on in terms of massaging their message <clears throat> with some voters in these swing districts. And then, of course, it's all eyes on Florida. Obviously, the big ticket is going to be the governor's race, but DeSantis has all this money. And really, you have Mr. Christ behind him in terms of that and really being the underdog. I think what's more interesting is the Senate race, Marco Rubio versus uh, Congresswoman Val Demings, because in one recent poll, she was actually ahead. And this is something, again, abortion, she is really going to take to the voters in Florida. I want to stick on uh, the governor race because Charlie Crist is a former governor of the state. He won the primary, and right? And he is going up on the Democratic ticket against uh, the incumbent, who is also potentially a presidential candidate. Can you talk about the fundraising aspect, how that potentially could shape this debate, could shape this race in a way that goes far beyond just a local, uh, local election? It's certainly gone far beyond that because you also already have Governor DeSantis out and about 
in places like Arizona, helping some of the Republican uh, hopefuls there trying to get ahead. He already has taken on nationwide um, uh, performance and popularity in the Republican Party. Yes, if you look at the polls, former President Trump is ahead if there was a GOP ticket for 2024. But second, and with a ton of cash, is Governor DeSantis. And his cash is very different than the former president's. He's getting big checks from the likes of Ken Griffin and others uh, on Wall Street, like Paul Tudor Jones, especially as many of them start to uh, move their bases and employees to Florida, where the former president has more of a grassroots, a few dollars here and there. So that's something DeSantis would have to work on if he was looking for 2024, that grassroots campaign. But you look at the Florida race, potentially you're going to see Democrats really want to focus on uh, uh, Mr. Chris, the congressman, former Republican governor, looking for his old job back because he has said in his speech last night, if we stop this man here, then 2024 is over for him. MH, thank you. A difficult moment in this country for many people. Amory Hordern down in D.C. This story from Business Week today, Tom, I think we all need to read it. It's called a tsunami of shutoffs. And here's the stat for you. Some 20 million households across the country, yeah. so that's about one in six American homes, have fallen behind on their utility bills. According to the National Energy Assistant Directors Association, it's the worst crisis the group has ever documented. So we've been talking about falling gasoline prices in America. Nat gas prices, Tom, as we've been discussing right. in the last couple of days, have been soaring and so have electricity prices with it. I'm certain Chairman Powell will address this. John, this is quintile and decile analysis. You can make a case that the lower quintile or decile does okay because they're waiting on the fancy people, but it's the lower middle class. It's absolutely crushed in a slowdown. That's what's going on right now. Some would say not only two, maybe it's three Americas. Lisa, one in six American homes fallen behind on their utility bills. It just shows the pain of some of these gas prices, of the electricity prices that will only continue to get worse as time goes on, and especially given all the other inflationary pressures. It's a, it's a significant concern. Futures unchanged on the S&P 500 this morning. Good morning to you all. Coming right up, Sabadra Japper of SockGen. Looking forward to that. From New York, this is Bloomberg. from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures almost totally unchanged through much of this morning on the S&P 500. Positive now by about 0.05%. On the Nasdaq 100 up by 0.04%. On the S&P over the previous three days, three days of losses on the S&P 500. Going into Jackson Hole, the annual Fed get-together, and I speak from Chairman Powell. We caught up with Andrew Hollenhorst of City a little bit earlier this morning. He's still looking at 4% on Fed funds by year-end and looking for a 75 basis point rate hike next September, this September, at the next Fed meeting. Going into it, your bond market's set up as follows, 2s, 10s and 30s, your two-year, in at around 3.30 over the last couple of days. A lift to yields just a few months ago, up by two basis points to 3.32. Just bear in mind the highs of the year on June 14th. June 14th, about 3.45 intraday on a two-year yield. So we're still off those levels, but get in there slowly. I'll tell you where we are getting quickly, quickly higher on a German two-year. Let's take a look at Europe. Your German two-year... So the highs were the middle of June. We're getting close, not there yet. They were about 123 or something like that, if my memory serves me well. July 28th, we were at 25 basis points on a German two-year. Look at the move now. 92 basis points. Let's oh, call okay, it 93. Why? Well, is, we're is starting it, is, to factor in, Tom, more ECB rate hikes once again. Is and you see e that in rate pricing this morning. Is it ECB rate hikes or is it the shock over the level of inflation? Well, Tom, both? I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, both. One leads to the other. And we're expecting the ECB to hike another 50 basis points. But, Tom, what's interesting about this, you've seen this move since the end of July. Yields up on a German two-year, so that's the front end of the German curve. What haven't you seen? You haven't seen euro strength. You've seen euro weakness. Euro dollar, 99.30, Tom, negative four-tenths of 1%. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, it's there. And, again, this goes to ECB. Is it September 8th, right? September 8th. Yeah. More work to do. That's the cross-asset price action. Let's get you some stocks to watch this morning. We can do that with Bramo. Lisa, 
walk us through it. So there are some really interesting stories under the hood that is not that interesting. These are very interesting. Nordstrom, chief among them, those shares wow. down nearly 13%. They reported earnings yesterday after the bell, and they were dreadful. They downgraded the full year ahead forecasts and really flew in the face of some of these expectations that wealthier shoppers, wealthier households were sticking in better than others and still consuming. They're going to be cutting a lot of the prices on their inventory to clear it out. Again, disinflationary. We've seen this throughout retailers and we also saw this kind of disinflationary trend with toll brothers coming out saying that its sales uh, declined by 60 percent this is more high-end home buyers that are really moving away from uh, committing to orders ahead of what they see as persistently higher mortgage rates petco health and wellness i'm doing this just for you tom they report any minute now, those shares are uh, down 7%. And we're expecting perhaps some sense of whether people are willing to shell out for their pets, even amid some of the higher base costs that they are facing. Otherwise, we are also watching Twitter shares. Yesterday, there was a concern about a whistleblower case against Twitter with their chief, the former uh, chief security officer coming out and saying that there were some real lapses in security, leading to a lot of congressional interest. Those shares barely moving, but I'm really watching to see whether they possibly respond to some of of this Salesforce expected to report earnings. This comes as we get a real uh, question around software. How much can people continue to buy in the face of some of the weakness? And NVIDIA, this is going to be fascinating, also set to report earnings today, Tom. How much do we see persistent weakness in the chip sector? This has been an area, a theme. How much does this portend a slowdown in the apples of the world, which have been bulletproof, considering yeah. the lack of demand that a lot of these chip makers have been talking about? The chip makers are really separate from that, but then all of a sudden they're not. Uh, separate. Uh, Lisa Bramitz there with the equity analysis. Right now on the bond analysis, Sobrata Rajapa joins us, head of the U.S. rate strategy at SockGen. Sobrata, I'm absolutely fascinated by something off the radar, which is to me the real yield that hasn't moved given inflation that's out there, given the idea that we may have higher interest rates. Are you surprised that the 10-year real yield is positive, 0 0.46? Shouldn't it be higher? I think what you've been seeing in the last few weeks is exactly what we saw ahead of the June uh, FOMC meeting, where the market started to price in, uh, you know, much higher inflation expectations. So the move higher in 10-year yields this time around is mostly all because of a sharp rise in inflation expectations. And this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. You're seeing inflation expectations rise quite meaningfully uh, across uh, the, the globe, and, and especially in Europe and, and the U.K., and, you know, the uh, break-evens in, in, the, in the U.S. are also starting to widen in tandem with what you're seeing uh, globally. So the market <clears throat> is starting to uh, price in perhaps uh, the potential for inflation to remain persistently high over the, the longer run, which is a little bit of a paradigm shift because for the last couple <clears throat> of months, the market was giving the Fed a lot of credibility in being able to bring down inflation expectations by well, raising rates. A delicate question, and maybe off your remit, but it's seen through yield. Is Chairman Powell losing credibility because the United Kingdom and continental Europe are falling apart? I think it's definitely making the Fed's job a lot harder because there's a lot of externalities that they have to factor in. For instance, they have to take into account what's going to happen in, in uh, China. There's a meaningful slowdown in growth there. Uh, what's happening in, in Europe with, you know, the potential for, uh, you know, a, a winter that's going to be very, very rough and much higher inflation uh, in Europe. So in some respects, you know, the, the remit for the Fed is not just the U.S., but also what's happening globally. And globally, inflation is, is a big concern. So they're going to have to factor that in into their into how they look at the, the markets in the U.S. And it's the same for the recession. You look at recession probabilities, they're rising a lot faster in, in Europe and in the UK. They actually have a contraction penciled in for next year. So those are the kinds of things that Fetcher Powell has to weigh into what, into his uh, his equation for what he does with, uh, with the U.S. as far as policy is concerned, in addition to what we're seeing in the data in the U.S. and the inflation uh, trajectory in the U.S. Zabajra, what does President Lagarde do with this as a backdrop? right now they've got a really really tough hand what do they do you know it's very very tough one they're sort of coming uh you know from uh from they're behind the fed if you will in in raising rates i mean they're trying to play catch up there's going to be 50 basis point rate hike at the at the next ecb meeting uh perhaps you know the fed market's pricing nearly one point one and a quarter percent of hikes by the end of this year so 
they're going to have to deliver a much more aggressive path of, of, of rate hikes. But like you pointed out, John, earlier, and it's a very good point, is that as they're raising rates, you know, the, the currency is actually going to continue to weaken because of the backdrop on, on recession and a meaningful slowdown in, in growth and the risks associated with the war in Ukraine. So it really, really is a complicated, uh, you know, of, of optim optimization function uh, for the ECB because it's not just about inflation, but it's also about, uh, again, externalities. In the United States, there's a huge debate brewing about whether the Fed can raise rates to a certain level and then hold them there to see how long it'll take to get inflation down or whether they have to uh, raise rates to a somewhat more punitive level. And we've heard that even this morning. Yesterday, we heard that with Jan Hatzias. This morning, uh, we heard this from Jim Karen on the Jan Hatzias camp and then Andrew Hollenhorst saying, no way, they've got to go much further than that. Where do you stand? I think the market is extraordinarily efficiently priced in for what the Fed said they're going to do for the next couple of years. So I think Fed funds rate gets to around maybe three and a quarter percent by the end of this year, uh, and then uh, perhaps to three and a half percent to to three point seven five percent by uh, next year. It, you know, to me, this whole argument that they should you know hike well beyond four percent. Uh, and then uh, sort of that's the only way they're going to be able to rein in inflation. It doesn't make a lot of sense because if they do that, then there, there's a potential that, that things break. The economy in the U.S. is still is, is quite brittle. So if they do tighten policy quite aggressively, there's a, there's a greater risk that we could go into a much deeper recession, in which case they'd have to cut rates and pivot a lot faster. Oh, if they yeah. go sort of gradually, get to around 35 to 3.75% sometime next year, and then keep rates uh, you know, steady, I think that's a much better outcome than aggressively hiking rates and then have to cut soon after they get well beyond 4%. Before we let you go, I'd love to get your sense of where you think that inflation is going to end the year, CPI, in the United States. You know, that's that's a tough one. I mean, it's really hard to know. I think, uh, you know, the trajectory, I think, broadly speaking, is for inflation to continue to gradually decline. But it's really the the, the majority of the declines you're going to see are going to be in, in upcoming years, not so much this year. What the Fed will be looking to see is if we actually see, um, you know, inflation starting to trend lower month after month. I think that would be a win for this year. Subhadra, thank you. Subhadra Jaffer of Sokchen. Difficult time for Europe and the ECB. Difficult time for Fed Chair Jay Powell. We'll hear from him on Friday. Lisa, in some ways, it's not about how high rates go. It's at what point does it start to bite into this economy? I'd be far more interested to know, to know whether we get to the end of this year and rates are still rising and unemployment has started to climb that would give you a decent idea of where this economy will be. We haven't even talked about the balance sheet and how that factors in, too. QT. I mean, QT that hasn't happened, right? We've seen the uh, balance sheet stay around the same place that it has been, around near around $9 trillion, but it is going to decline more rapidly starting in September. How much do we get some indication from Jackson Hole that there are limits to the balance sheet involvement, that they want to cap where those, uh, those balance sheets end up? And how does that factor into the kind of restriction that we see in policy? And Tom, that's what's interesting about the city call. It's 4% on Fed funds by year end. What about the overlay of balance sheet reduction exactly. that we're all looking for too? What were the numbers? A trillion well, over 12 months. These are the moving parts, and I'm going to go to the x-axis again. You said by year end. Year end is approaching rapidly, John. And, and Three, I four just months think away. Some of these calls, you know, by year end, whatever that means, that's tomorrow in Fed speak. And it's going to be interesting to see. Of course, John, by year end means when the bears hibernate. They will not be hibernating out in Jackson Hole. We'll see him, John, on the road north. Uh, but, you know, out of the deep surveillance archive, this photo from Michael McKee from five or six years McKee ago. Michael McKee snapped this one. Yeah, he was out walking around. This is Bear 399, who's truly legendary. We're making jokes about it. <laughs> Put the but this up, is really not something. Michael McKee. <laughs> and these are three of the cublets as, as well. That's, that's uh, Ben people. and Jerome and Paul. Ben and Jerome. And, and, and what's Paul. great, and I, we did some research, John, and what's great about Chris 399 and something good to know, it's 3 a.m. when we begin our broadcast tomorrow doing the sound checks. Where's Mike Janet? That. You forgot Janet. Yo, she's Janet. leading the pack. Oh, Janet's leading yeah, the yeah, pack. Yeah, yeah, she's Mama Cub. She's Mama Cub. Because yeah. yeah. Ben 399 is a grandma. You know, John, <laughs> John, we did research. Persona. Yeah, you know what? I did. Molder Hiker, Lisa. Oh, God, you guys. Molder Hiker. <sighs> Ursa really? Horribilis, do you know what they love? What do they love, They Tom? love Marmite. You're going to be out there with your Marmite <laughs> and toasted cheese. Let's not joke about that. And, and BearSmart.com says this is, you know, a risk. I'm not touching smart. Marmite. I don't know what, what, what website you're on. BearSmart.com. <laughs> All the news e you need to know. Everyone at home now working out if that's a real website.
From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. The U.S. will mark Ukraine's Independence Day today by giving the country another $3 billion in weapons. It's also the six-month anniversary of the Russian invasion. U.S. diplomats have warned that Russia is preparing attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure and government facilities in coming days. Meanwhile, about one in six American homes, 20 million households, that is, have fallen behind on their utility bills and face the possibility of a shutoff. According to the National Energy Assistance Directors Association, it's the worst crisis the group has ever documented. There's been a big surge in those electricity prices propelled by the soaring cost of natural gas. And in the UK, the favourite to be the next Prime Minister has hinted at an emergency cost of living boost for the elderly. Liz Truss wouldn't go into detail about how she would help households facing soaring energy bills, but she suggested the assistance would go to those on fixed income, such as pensioners. Shares of Aviva jump today. Bloomberg's learned that Francis Schneider Electric may buy out minority shareholders of the industrial software designer. Schneider already owns 60% of Aviva. Before today, shares had fallen some 48% in London over the last year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We're seeing these food crunches happening even in despite the war in Ukraine, which has also placed a lot of upward pressure on food prices. And so we're hearing from CEOs that they're going to continue to push through higher costs for food. And so that's probably going to continue to be a pressure that the Fed really doesn't have much control over. So a lot of things they don't have much control over. That was Dana Peterson, the chief economist of the conference board. Mike McKee with some advice. You just need to be faster than Tom. That's all he said. <laughs> just need to be faster than Tom. That was it. I don't He's, know what he, he means. He said by that, that before. That is, that, that, that's a repeated, <laughs> a repeated statement. Features positive a tenth on the SP on the NASDAQ up a little more than a tenth of 1%. Yeah. Waiting for Chairman Powell this Friday. Yields coming up, Tom, about a basis point, 3.0. Let's call it 3.06% this morning. Major shout out, John, to the federal government in the park ranger systems of Jackson Hole up to Yellowstone, as I say, Jellystone. Park. A ranger there, John, a couple years ago told me there's more wildlife now in the valley than there were the times of the Indians in the 19th century. That's an amazing They've stat, done, Tom. Did not know that. Yeah, amazing, amazing job. Futures do a little bit better, up six. We're moving off the snooze fest. Helping us with that is Kriti Duke Gupta with an important chart. Kriti, what do you have? Well, we want to really kind of focus in on what Dana Peterson was just talking about, f food prices and the crunch that we're facing in the context, by the way, of the war in Ukraine. So for our radio audience, we're looking at a chart here of the Bloomberg Grains Index. It goes back about a year, and basically you see that massive surge in prices in about February, the anticipation going into the war in Ukraine, then, of course, the war itself, where you saw that surge in prices, given that some of the kind of uh, breadbasket of the world, Ukraine, that supply is coming offline. Until fast forward to June, when you kind of see prices make a little bit of a round trip, and it was staying down there for a little bit. Some of those were recession fears, a stronger dollar. Some of it was also simply a question of weather. Uh, and now you're starting to see a little bit of an uptrend as well. That's coming as you have the likes of Romania, India, even the United States, not actually able to perhaps make up some of that lost supply in a way that the market was pricing before. Tom, I think that's really the key point of this chart and something we want to keep pay a massive attention to. It's very important. Kriti, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate that. We've got lots going on. Michael Magnavitz joins us. He He's been listening all morning to uh, what we're saying about Grizz and, of course, going to Jackson Hole as well. Brad, see if you can bring up the video. Now, this is the acclaimed bear cam. This is one of the great things, John, for learning the behavior of grizzly bear. And we wanted to really get this up, if we can, of the dead of night of Alaska, John. This is going to be like what we see tomorrow. Oh, we don't have it. I'm sorry, we don't have that. But John, it, it, the, such the, a great run-up as well. Everyone's so disappointed. So. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, it's it's a pitch black that you and I are going to see tomorrow. Lisa's going to be inside. In no, makeup, in, I'm not know. scared of bears, and this is actually really illuminating. You guys are frightened of bears, and it, it tells no, me a no, lot. No, That's no, no, Lisa, scared stiff. <laughs> Frightening doesn't get it going. We're also frightened about the commodity business, which is not funny. 
and very quietly in August has crept up on us worldwide. Michael Magnovitz is expert in patient on this at Rabobank. Michael, thank you so much for joining us as we move to Wyoming. As we fly to Wyoming, we fly across levels of drought, corn down 6%. Cotton down 20-some percent, and it speaks to global food shortages. How bad is it? Well, it's pretty bad. It, the U.S. is largely the world's food reserve. And when it starts to see issues, uh, that has ramifications for everybody, not least because um, although you know, as we heard earlier on the segment, we have seen a pullback in prices, but that's cold comfort to many consumers internationally who are buying in U.S. dollars. And we're still seeing levels much, much greater than we have seen uh, historically. So the U.S. drought uh, is certainly not welcome at a time when global reserves and particularly exported reserves are, are very low. Michael, I've been really focused on the farm tour that's been going on in the United States uh, throughout this week to try to gauge how well some of these crops are doing in light of the droughts, in light of the extreme weather, and it's all over the place. I mean, some places are facing drought, some places extreme rain. How has this been going? How has the, uh, the farm tour sort of yielded information in terms of how much the U.S. can support the rest of the world in food exports? I've had the pleasure of going on the uh, pro, -farm, pro farmer crop tour in the past, and uh, basically what they're seeing right now is variable yields, uh, which is exactly what you don't want at a time when the world is really sitting on historically low reserves. Um, and and this is a time I should I should note when the world is at its most plentiful in terms of an annual row crop. You know, the harvest is when you should see pressure in terms of prices, and it's really worrying if you start to see prices driving up at a time when you have, you know, your most, your harvest basically on the horizon, because it implies potentially that prices will be higher for longer. So what does this mean uh, down the line? Does this mean just that prices are going to go up just a little bit, that we're going to see surging food prices, that certain regions in the world are not going to have the same kind of supplies of corn that they were expecting? Translate this in three months forward. Well, it's, it's actually um, going to see, you're, what you're going to see is low, so low supplies providing foundational support for higher prices. But we are not, in our, in our view, going to see prices skyrocketing because the consumer behavior has already changed. And that applies to a lot of uh, areas, whether you're talking about feed or food or even energy products. Like, for example, AAA is looking at gasoline in the United States and calling consumption COVID-like. Well, 10% of U.S. gasoline is ethanol, which comes from corn. And so what we are seeing is uh, demand contraction, in particular in corn, which hasn't seen demand contract in a decade. We're finally seeing that. So consumer behavior is changing in response. It's like, you know, everybody starts shifting their consumption patterns. They move to Aldi's. But what happens when prices are at Aldi's are like Whole Foods? You know, and that's really what we're worried about is um, consumers changing their behavior. It's probably going to cap prices and solve inflation. Michael, we need to catch up again soon. Let's not leave it so long. Michael Magnovitz there of Rubber Bank. Lisa, you started the conversation this week on this very topic, and I just went through a range of stories in the last couple of days. India may import wheat. We were talking about perhaps them exporting and solving some of these problems. They may import wheat now. China and those power cuts, we know because of the drought and what could happen to hydroelectricity. Rice at risk because of extreme drought and an extreme summer in China. And then dry cornfields in the United States. This is something you started the conversation with this yeah, week, Lisa. It's a big, big issue. Adding insult to injury with all the supply chain disruptions and now weather disruptions that are causing some real threats to the world's food supply, not, alone the, uh, not, not just the uh, energy supply. How how do we deal with this going forward? How much of an untold story is this as we go into the fall and the yeah. winter of discontent? I have smack dab, John, in my Bloomberg launch pad of equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Absolutely in the middle of it, I have rice, corn, and wheat. And they really haven't moved yet. And it'll be fascinating to see. The one I watch, John, more than any of them is U.S. rice. It's different than Thai rice. I get that. But we've been very lucky in that rice really hasn't moved within the drought worries. You heard Michael there at the end of that conversation, though, Tom. Yeah. The consumer pushback. It's already starting. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no question about that. John, I think the video is, 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 is ready to go. And this gives us just a whisper of where we'll be tomorrow. This is the acclaimed bear cam in anything. Alaska. And you can't see anything, John. You're not going to see anything it's tomorrow when the bear comes up behind you. Okay.
This is the acclaimed bear cam oh. in Alaska. Oh, guys, come and on. it is as dark as it will be for John Farrow and me tomorrow as we greet <laughs> dun, dun, dun. 399. Where's Lisa? Is Lisa coming Lisa's with Lisa's inside. Yeah, no, I'm out. not scared. You're staying inside. Are you bears, frightened? Bears don't scare me. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I feel real kinship. You relate. <laughs> <laughs> Deep, deeply. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. I think the rally's just gotten a little bit ahead of itself. Clearly, the global economy is going through a downshift. There's not a really acute pocket of stress in a specific sector. We still have a large gap between jobs and workers, but at least we're moving in the right direction there. Inflation is going to come down. Whether it'll get as quickly as the Fed would like to see back to their target or not, I think it'll get there. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keene, our world headquarters in New York, on radio, on television, getting ready for a speech by the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, and he does it with a global slowdown in America going this way or that way. John, which is it? The wrong way right now, Tom. And throw in Beijing, throw in Frankfurt, throw in London. These are really difficult right now, Tom, in the UK, across Europe and in Asia as well. And that's problematic for this Federal Reserve. And one thing we started with this week is whether Chairman Powell would navigate, right. even attempt to, talk about some of the weakness abroad. I think it's been underplayed. And John Visiting will be the governor of the Bank of England, Mr. Bailey. What does Mr. Bailey want to hear from Jerome Powell? Well, he needs some help on the FX front, doesn't he? What he wants to hear and what he will hear are two very different things, I think, Tom. I think that right now the ECB and the Bank of England need a weaker dollar and a stronger domestic currency, and they can't buy one. And when I say they can't buy one, just look at how rate pricing has changed for the ECB and look at what has happened with the currency. We have had the yield move at the front end of the German curve since the end of July by a lot. I think it's tripled, maybe more so than that, Tom. And what's the euro done? It's weaker. That's a big problem for this ECB as they look to hike. 50 basis points. What's interesting here, John, is we could have a grizzly accord instead of a plaza accord as we had in the early 80s out of Jackson Hole. We could have an accord to bring the dollar down. I don't really hear that happening, but the fact is, John, of all the markets moving in a quieter day today, I get that. Strong dollar is front and center. Euro dollar 99.29, Tom. You and I have said it repeatedly yeah. this week. It takes some getting used to, but maybe we need to get used to it. Sterling 117.79. Uh, Lisa, at Jackson Hole, there will be debate about two Americas. There's no question about that. And John mentioned the Business Week article on utilities, people behind in America that can't pay their energy bills. One of the themes of this Jackson Hole are the limitations of monetary policy and they're running up against it in every which way. I mean, they might have had a broader mandate before inflation, but now they're trying <clears> to fight inflation that has a multifaceted uh, cause, whether it's the supply chain disruptions, the increases in wage some of the distortions from the pandemic at the same time that you're seeing the recovery happen very differently. How do they speak about where they look to other policy to bridge gaps that they cannot fill anymore with monetary policy? We Tom. make jokes about the toxic brew that's out there. John, we've really ignored the equity markets today. 4138 SPX, Dow near 33,000. Again, the VIX 20 out to 24, some stress there as well. The toxic brew of what Chairman Paul says and what it'll mean for the stock market. Three days losses into yeah. today tom let's whip through it just a little bit of positivity out there this morning I agree. some tiny yes. gains nice. up two tenths of one percent on the s p on the nasdaq up about two tenths of one percent as well down a basis point on a 10 year to 3.0387 percent something you led with though tom at the start of this program this morning crude let's call it 95 on wti 94.86, up more than 1%. We'll lift 101 on Brent crude as well. And dollar yen is what's not moving. 136.63. It'll be fascinating to see what yen does over the next uh, number of days. Right now, as we mentioned, the toxic brew that Lisa's spoken of over the recent weeks, someone's written that up. Joseph Quinlan is head of uh, chief investment officer, I should say, of market strategy at Merrill Bank of America and joins us this morning. Joe, you speak of a toxic trifecta that Chairman Powell faces. What are the three items of your toxic trifecta? Well, Tom, rarely have you seen China, U.S., and Europe be in this toxic brew. And in, in U.S., it's, of course, it's inflation. In China, zero COVID policy that's really flatlined the economy. And then Europe war and the energy crisis. So this is 70% of GDP, roughly speaking, the big three. 
and rarely are all three sinking or wobbling as we speak. And it's very rare globally. So we're on the cusp or we're in a global recession as we speak. I look at the global recession. We see that certainly with China. Can we bring that over to America, or do you need to wait for NBER to tell you there's a recession? I'm going to wait for my colleagues at the bank to call it as well. Our colleagues, top of the house, are looking for a shallow recession in the next couple of quarters. Technically, we're already there, housing market. So really, you know, it, it, we're already kind of t talking recession here. But here's an important point, Tom, in the sense that U.S. recessions they're not uncommon, and when we come out of a recession, the U.S. economy is typically stronger. The weak go by the wayside, the stronger gets stronger. We kind of reset, and that's very important for clients to realize is that recessions are not uncommon, and when we come out, the economy has firmer footing and is stronger. Joe, where to hide? You say FANG 2.0. What is FANG 2.0? FANG 2.0, John, it's just kind of, it's, it's a play on hard assets and hard politics, hard power. So it's fuels, it's agriculture, it's aerospace and defense, it's nuclear renewables, it's gold, metals, minerals, and it's really about the hard assets in this world we live in. And that's kind of like where we've been hiding out. It's been working well, relatively speaking, to the rest of the market. Do you think it'll continue to work well? Because we've heard a lot about people pulling back, particularly on the oil story, as we see fear of recession continue to percolate around the world. Do you think that that's been overplayed and that there still is a story in these hard assets? Or are you starting to get a little bit more neutral? Well, Lisa, we did see the pullback in commodity prices July, parts of August. But really, when you look around the world with the electrical vehicle revolution, green revolution, it's very metal, metal, mineral, fossil fuel intensive. And one thing that we don't talk enough about is resource protectionism, whether it's lithium, whether it's agriculture. That's not going away anytime soon. So we do think Bang 2.0 has some legs here, for sure. Right now, as you look at the overall sentiment, do you think that people are overly bullish or overly bearish? Because we have seen this rally stick, and now people attribute the recent pullback to this belief from, uh, from some that the Fed is going to be hawkish. Do you think that there is some sort of balance here that's, a, that's off skew? Well, I think there was with the rally, Lisa, in June and July, because as we were rallying here in, say, July and August, the global growth was cratering. So I think the markets kind of stepped back and realized, wait a minute, the global backdrop is more challenging than people realize. But I do think, really, when you look at the U.S. relative to the rest of the world, we're going to come out of this downturn sooner than others and more resilient and more dynamic. So I think there's a balance there. And we are seeing folks, if you want to allocate capital, it's more towards the U.S. than, say, the rest of the world. And by the way, the rest of the world, you, you talk about the stronger dollar. They're voting as well, and they're putting their money into U.S. assets. Joe, I often think, what is the montage we can make in 12 months that makes everyone look really silly? And I wonder if it's a montage of people just saying the consumer's strong, the consumer's strong, the consumer's strong. Because data after data points suggest that perhaps they're not. We've put a story out in Bloomberg Business Week this morning on the 20 million across the country, that's one in six American homes, who ultimately have fallen behind on their utility bills. We've got one association who are calling this the worst crisis the group has ever documented. Now, Joe, do you think we're going to be able to say in six months' time, 12 months' time, that the consumer is strong, given the kind of dynamics that you're talking about? When we hear people say the recession will be short and shallow, the consumer is strong, what's the risk to that view? Well, John, the only good news is the employment, right? Good jobs creation, a lot of job openings out there. But you're right in the sense in real terms, the consumer is falling behind. What they're reaching for their credit cards, they've worked down their savings. So I do think the consumer hangs in there, but there's a lot more. I, I kind of the optimism, the spending, buying lower price goods, that's going to continue. So the consumer is still struggling, working its way through. And they're hanging in there, but I do think it gets weaker as we go into, say, early 2020. Do you expect unemployment to be climbing by the end of the year, Joe? No, I don't, John. I mean, we'll see. I, I think it's going to be spotty. Three and a half percent. I mean, maybe a backup here, you know, uh, slightly. But the job market is very robust. Every client, every small business person we speak to, cannot find the workers, and that's a, still a big issue. And they're willing to pay up, and so that's <clears> the <throat> kind of give, gives the consumer some kind of hope to hang in there. Joe Quinlan of Merrill Bank of America. Joe, thank you. Appreciate the context, the perspective, as always. Lisa, there's a data point out there for everyone. Here's one for you. Payrolls in the report a few Fridays ago was tremendous.
It was really, really good. And to that point, and Joe Quinlan saying that hiring is still incredibly robust, Liberty Street Economics, the blog that New York, the, the New York Fed puts out, uh, research on, had a piece yesterday talking about the main drivers of inflation being wage inflation, as well as a lot of the supply chain disruptions. If you take a look at both of those, they're still going strong. So if you take a look at some of the disinflationary elements, the main drivers, at least according to this study, in particular having to do with wages and attracting labor, still is a significant concern for people who are worried about inflation. Which one is it, Tom? Which one is it? Is the labor I, market stronger or are consumers falling behind on their bills? Labor's a lagging indicator. That's classic economics. But, John, I'm so glad you brought that up with Mr. Quinlan. The, the idea here that he said the unemployment rate really is not going to move, is Jerome Powell going to guesstimate that tomorrow? I mean, this, this, this is how odd it is right now with all the lather everybody's in, all the uncertainty can you imagine if unemployment stays I tell him, sub four, I'm with sub you. four point two? It's I don't stunning. think he can pre-commit right now. What he can do is establish a reaction function. You would have to imagine, Tom, yes. if unemployment's not yes. climbing and inflation's still sticky, this is a Fed still hiking. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think it's fair. But I love, love what Hatsi has said yesterday. The idea that that we have to start defining, as Draghi did years ago, the length of time. The media and, frankly, a lot of the punditry don't want to do that. They want to look out one month, one meeting, two meetings at the most. What do we do if we want to look out 10 meetings? And that's where you go to back to job analysis, wage growth, you know, wage inflation analysis, and also just sheer economic growth. This is the raise and hold story we might hear a little bit more about in the coming days, Lisa. Raise to what? We often talk about that, to Tom's point. Hold for how long? Yeah, and you know, just to the labor market standpoint, how much has it transformed as the participation rate falls, as productivity falls? What are we looking at when we talk about the unemployment rate in a very new labor market? Right now, we're talking about a stronger dollar. We'll do that with Vasily Serebriakov, the FX and macro strategist that UBS is going to join us very shortly. From New York, futures up, up two tenths of one percent. Stronger equity market bouncing back, a small bounce from three days of losses. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. President Biden says he's proud to announce the U.S. is giving almost $3 billion more in weapons to Ukraine. The announcement came on the day Ukraine celebrates its independence. It's also the sixth month anniversary of the day Russia invaded. In June, for the first time on record, the UAK imported no fuel from Russia. The British government achieved its ambition to phase out all purchases of natural gas and oil from Russia following that invasion of Ukraine. Russia had been the UK's largest supplier of refined oil. Japan is planning a dramatic shift back to nuclear power more than a decade after the Fukushima disaster. That includes restarting a number of shutdown reactors and developing new plants using next-generation technologies. Japan is trying to... Uh, are trying to avoid more strains on power grids that have buckled under heavy demand this summer. And today, President Biden will make his long-awaited announcement on student debt relief. Some of his allies are likely to be disappointed. The president has been considering forgiving 10000 per uh, per borrower in student debt whilst capping the relief at incomes of $125,000 to $150,000. Advocates say the debt forgiveness limit should be higher to help black or lower income students. And shares of Aviva are up by more than 30% today. Pre-market, Bloomberg's learned that France's Schneider Electric may buy out minority shareholders of the industrial software designer. Schneider already owns 60% of Aviva. Shares have fallen 48% in London over the last year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Like in a Greek tragedy, there's just not that much that they can do. There's destiny that's approaching. Um, you know, the economy is weak. The, you know, when we talk about supply chain disruptions, we, we're not getting our exercise bikes. When they talk about it, they're not able to heat their homes. Um, that's really weighing 
on uh, sentiment in the euro and the ECB doesn't have a tool to address it. The euro weaker again this morning. That was the brilliant Steve Englander of Standard Chartered. A weaker euro, a stronger dollar equities advancing two tenths of one percent from New York City this morning. Good morning. Euro dollar negative a third of one percent. Ninety nine thirty seven yield not giving me much. Three percent on a 10 year. Let's call it three point zero four and crude climbing. Ninety four sixty. We're up Tom by let's call it nine tenths of one percent higher. It's going to be interesting to see, John, the music that we just heard there on radio and television. Very soothing, isn't it? It's soothing music. What I love about it, it's Botsford in Berlin, Dance of the Grizzly from 1910. That's not the what it's Irving called. The Great Irving Berlin. That's not what it's No, called. I think that it is. I, you know, I was told that by our music advisor. Okay, but well, I trust them. You know, I, I trust sure. them uh, too. Right now, we trust an important discussion at Jackson Hole on dollar strength. If you do fancy math, to be blunt, we're not at Plaza Accord tension, but nevertheless is maybe the unspoken grizzly bear in the lodge. Vasily Serebrikov joins us now with UBS, FX and Macro Strategists. Should they be speaking about a too strong dollar at Jackson Hole? Well, they can be. They can be speaking about many things. Uh, the 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 irony, perhaps, is that the of course U.S. should be fairly happy with a strong dollar to the extent that it helps bring inflation under control. This is maybe one time in history where um, a lot of countries would actually probably want a, a stronger currency, not a weaker currency. We always think of it the other way around, but this is this is the time in history where a uh, stronger uh, stronger currency will help help. Uh, help the fight against inflation but only the u.s is getting it um i don't you know i don't think this is going to be the i don't think this is going to be the primary topic though it's it's right. uh, it's all about volatility right they, un unless those moves become you know extremely violent and volatile in the kind of g20 um approach to to currency markets I, you know i don't think this is going to be a, the dominant topic for sure if, if it is not a smooth curve what is the level of DXY or the level of Euro, you know, common numbers that we look at where it breaks or it cracks or it kinks? Do you have a level in your head? Yeah, I, I think, you know, w w when we've kind of thought about the, the scenarios in Europe, um, you know, if you get to a worst case uh, scenario where, say, for example, gas supplies are cut off completely, um, it's completely conceivable also that euro reaches 95 or even 90. Um, I, I think it's going to be hard to get there uh, without any significant change in the macro catalyst. So right now, the way the euro trades, it's really, and I think it's important to understand, this is a summer sentiment and momentum trade. Um, and that that's, can get us, I think, to 99, can get us to 98. But you need, in our view, you need a new macro catalyst, and those catalysts are, are possible exactly uh, surrounding your, some of those European risks to get us to, to much lower level. Vasily, within, within that, is it in the destiny of the ECB? Do they have it within their hands to do something about this, or is it out of their hands? Well, th this is an interesting time where, of course, you know, the pricing for the ECB keeps going up. Uh, if you look at the September meeting, we're now pricing in some possibility, probability, that they're going to go more than 50 basis point, points. And from the market's perspective, this makes sense because inflation keeps pushing higher, energy costs keep, keep rising. It makes sense, perhaps, to front load some of these hikes because you're hiking into a slowing economy. So the more you do now, um, the more the sort of the less you, you, you'll have to do later on. But it's a bit of little help to the euro. And this is kind of the peculiarity of the currency market. Some of those relationships work until they don't. Um, European rates keep going higher. Yields keep going higher. It's not helping the euro. Why? Because the market doesn't believe that hiking into a slowing economy uh, helps the currency. I, I, you know, I, I think when when sort of we have full liquidity back in September, um, if if ECB is indeed more hawkish, I think it can help stem the fall in the euro to some extent. I don't think it's completely irrelevant, but it's certainly not not helping to the to the to the extent that it, it, it would have been in normal times. I think what would help the euro is obviously some kind of major shift in sentiment, you know, surrounding gas supplies, energy and things like yeah, that. Yeah, you've got to make a call on Putin. Ultimately, Lisa, you've got to make a call on Vladimir Putin and this war with Ukraine to make a call on the euro. Yeah, although, John, I do wonder, just going to Vasily's point, if the euro were to go down to 90, if there were some sort of cutoff in the supplies, when does it become an existential threat to the shared currency? I mean, at what point does this decimate an economy that's already reeling in the face of a lot of inflationary pressures? Do you think re-denomination risk returns here, Vasily, given the political backdrop? Yeah, I mean, 
I, I think I think it's I think we're still pretty far from that, right? Because essentially now you have the new anti-fragmentation tool. Um, remember the the problem with the European debt crisis in, originally, right? Before before Draghi took over, was that there was no real backstop. The backstop was sort of all this piecemeal fiscal sort of solutions. That there was never an ECB backstop. Now there is an ECB backstop. So I think that makes. Uh, that makes a big difference. But, you know, it, you, you can still have further discounting of European assets. I would say that, you know, if you look at the cross assets, right, FX is probably where it's been mostly priced in. Um, European equity is probably second and then and then some sort of core periphery spreads third. So I think what you're going to see is maybe um, some of this risk premium being priced more aggressively across different asset markets and not just the euro. So if it's a short term, weaker euro, longer term, are you a little bit more constructive? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, we're a bit more constructive. Well, I, I think, you know, ultimately, you know, let's look at the broader picture. And I know there's Jackson Hole um, is coming, et cetera. You can have 30 uh, seconds to do that. The the dollar is still a very pro cyclical currency. You should, be, you should be long the dollars when the economy is slowing, as it is now. But if this is a relatively shallow recession, and if U.S. inflation is peaking, as we, we believe it is, there will come a turning point, and, and that cyclical turn should coincide with some dollar weakness from very, very expensive levels. Vasily, thank you. Awesome to catch up with him, as always. A good friend of the show over the years. Vasily Serebriakov of UBS. Tom, looking potentially for a little bit more of a constructive view on the euro going towards the end of the year. Yeah, and we heard that from Stephen Englander as, as well. But you got to get there, John. And to be clear, if I do a bunch of fancy technical, I want to make this clear. We're not at the angst of the Plaza Accord. We make jokes about it, but we're nowhere near the Plaza or the Louvre Accord of the early 1980s when you look at the math of all this, except we have China. And what do you do if you ah. get China all of a sudden from 687 out to seven or through sure. seven yuan, then things may be Not changed. a million miles away right now, Tom. <clears throat> that could just, just be around the corner. Lisa, at the end of the day for Europe, it's not about yeah. forecasting ECB rates. It's about forecasting <clears throat> gas prices right now. That's what's bleeding into the single currency. I mean, you said it really well. Are we just basically betting on Putin when it comes to the euro? And at that point, how do you have any yeah. conviction at all? John, really important. Michael McKee just emailed me, and he says he we say? need to be bear aware. Be bear aware. Earphones on the set in Jackson Hole. Dangerous. A little bit of economic data in just a moment. Equity futures positive two tenths of one percent this morning. Good morning on the S and P. We advance on the Nasdaq up two tenths of one percent as well. Yields unchanged at three point zero four eight percent on a ten year euro dollar. Deeply negative now by four tenths of one percent. Ninety nine thirty one. We've got to catch up with Mike McKee in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, on some economic data. But Mike McKee, before we get to the data, we've got to see the hat. We have got to see the hat. Is this what TK is going to wear a little bit later <laughs> this week? We'll bring we'll bring it out for you uh, in in the open, John. Uh, that's a tease ahead for all your viewers. There we go. I'm looking forward to that. It's edge, of Kenny, it it's edge of Kenny Chesney, right. which is good. <laughs> well, we are back here in Jackson Hole, and we are getting ready for the Kansas City Fed Economic Symposium. But we're getting ready with some disappointing economic news this morning. Durable goods come in flat for the month. The expectation was for an eight tenths gain after a 2.2 percent uh, revised higher increase in June. These are July numbers. X transportation is up just three tenths. That's a little bit better than anticipated, but below uh, what we saw last month. Capital goods orders, non-defense, X air. This is your basic what goes into GDP for business spending kind of stuff. And that's up four tenths. It was up nine tenths in June. So a back off in business spending, not a drop completely, but a back off in business spending. And this is these are July numbers. And why it might be a little bit concerning is because of those S&P PMIs we saw yesterday that showed a real collapse in manufacturing during the month of August. So I don't know if this is a harbinger or not. Capital goods and uh, durable goods are very volatile, but it's not the best possible news to start this symposium week. Uh, Mike, very quickly, your one question before I get to Tom Purcelli. The idea that this will change the guesstimate of third quarter. How does durable goods fit into that? 
Well, it, it goes into the calculation, Tom, but it's so early in the quarter. These are July numbers for the very first month. It's not going to make a big difference at this point. Uh, I think the consensus is somewhere around 1.3% for the third quarter, which is obviously better than we saw in the first half of the year. But uh, we're going to need a lot more data to get a real handle on where we are. A bit disappointing this morning on the data front, Mike. Looking forward to catching up with you a little bit later this morning and the next hour. And looking forward to catching up with Mike in person tomorrow morning, Tom. It'll be good to see, and he'll lead our coverage here with regional Fed presidents. Particularly, it'll be interesting to see what James Bullard of St. Louis says as well. We have a most eventful half hour. We bring this to you commercial-free. Later on, we will think of Julian Robertson, who uh, died yesterday at 90 years old. We will talk on Wall Street. But right now, on the American labor economy, Tom Purcelli joins the chief U.S. economist at RBC Capital uh, Markets. Tom, I want to dovetail with another shop. This came out moments ago from Kalanovic over at Goldman Sachs, who's an equity strategist, and he posits good equity markets, forget about that, because of declining inflation. Do you at RBC Capital Markets perceive declining inflation? Yeah, we do. We think inflation will slow. Uh, and we think, it, it, you know, you could start to see some slowing show up right around the turn of the year at the core level. Headline is obviously a completely different animal. Um, we'll see what happens with uh, energy prices, which, uh, you know, our, our house call is that they will be on the rise um, over the coming months. But at the core level, yeah, we do. We think that it'll wind up slowing down um, before the end of the year. You have to get through this like one more month of sort of unfavorable year ago comp. Um, but once you get beyond that, we think that um, some of the sort of the, the, the price pressure that we're starting to see, the downward price pressure, will start to show through. <laughs> Again, let's be clear, everyone. It's not going to be in some sort of notable, meaningful way. Um, but you will start to see that process slow e again, even as early as before the end of the year. And then as we roll into um, the next uh, next year, I, I, I think it's really reasonable to think that core inflation could surprise people um, to, to the downside. I mean, there's a lot of price pressure that is in the pipeline right now, a lot of downward price pressure in the pipeline. Um, and we think that'll start to show up. Well, that's certainly what Marco Kalanovic over at J.P. Morgan uh, seems to believe as well. Still others say, well, look at wages and how much they're increasing. Look at some of these stickier elements. Look at food. Look yeah. at gas, which is reemerging as a pretty significant right. inflationary headwind. How do you factor those things in? When do you start to think, yeah. maybe I'm wrong and the Fed does need to go further uh, than perhaps some people think? So, so this is a this is a really great question, and and, and I think that it's it's important because I, I I can see a plausible scenario where headline prices um, are remaining you know sort of stable at high levels if you do get this this drift higher from an energy price perspective if food prices um, continue to uh, uh, remain firm although we're uh, let's just be clear we are seeing signs that food prices are slowing down but again just to your point like just for just for fun um, let's just say that all of that does happen. Um, you could see a scenario where headline prices uh, remain, you know, again, relatively high, but core prices slow. That's a really tricky spot for the Fed, and this is something we've been talking about and writing about for quite some time. The Fed needs to unhitch their wagon from headline prices. They can't control that stuff. They can't control food or energy prices. Um, and and I, I know it's, it's going to be a, a question of, hey, but what about inflation expectations? Yeah, but I, I get that. But if inflation expectations are rising because of things that the Fed can't control, um, then I, I think the Fed needs to make a, more of a distinction in, in that regard. Um, and so we would actually argue that the Fed is supposed to be really focused on core. Powell and, and others within the Fed have even recently said that that's what they're supposed to be um, following. But I, I think they just got caught up into this, this loop of they've really only talked about headline prices. Uh, I think that's going to come back to haunt them um, if you actually don't see headline prices slow with core, which is what we expect. Okay, so let's say the Fed comes out with this nuanced message that you're putting out there, which is this yeah. inflationary kind of feel, uh, gaining wind next year and yeah. giving them more space. If they yeah. say that, doesn't the market rip? And this is what I asked Lori Heinel, and this is sort of the conundrum. Financial conditions will move yeah. against them, especially considering the expectation yeah. for a hawkish speech from Jay Powell. Yeah, I think that's I think that's totally fair in the in the immediate term. But let's just be clear: there's a lot of challenges in the backdrop right now, right? Like, uh, I, I know some people who keep on latching on to this idea that hey, the payroll report you know showed acceleration in job gains. I, I get it, mm -hmm. but but does it make sense, right? I mean, so I think I heard Tom earlier say you know like look, labor is a lagging indicator, and he's 100% right. And, and it's funny to me that uh, that people just seem to sort of um, lose that narrative. So, but let's talk about the acceleration in jobs, which people are still talking about two weeks, you know, after the report or three weeks, whatever it's been. 
Jobless claims are up. Even if you make the adjustment for the, for, for the sort of the seasonal factor thing, they're still up. They're up about 30% from the lows. That tends to be consistent with um, uh, potential uh, seeing job losses uh, um, shortly thereafter. Um, also, it happens to coincide with uh, you know, countless companies talking about the idea of laying people off. Two, I think you have to keep in mind that the ISMs, um, all the uh, labor indicators within there are now below break even. Um, the, the labor differential from uh, the conference board, that's now starting to roll over. Um, uh, hours worked, hours worked are actually sliding. It's not something you would expect to see if labor was actually that tight. And that's actually taking average right. weekly earnings with it. I mean, there's a host of things. And by the way, I, there's more, but I'll just say this one last thing. The cherry on top of all that is volume of spending is slowing. I mean. I, you know, I, I don't know what more people need to see to understand okay. that actually things are squishier than is appreciated. Tom, on the same page with you as David Rosenberg, who partitions inflation like you do wage growth. And David Rosenberg publishes this morning that housing is approaching what he calls a tailspin. Is the ginormous yep. shock of the end of the year, which is the housing microdynamics fold over to rent dynamics, which flat or even stabilize? Yeah, so look, I think it's really easy to say that housing is in a recession right now. I mean, I don't think that's a heroic call in any way. I think most people probably appreciate that, or many people, are, I think, are be growing to appreciate that. I think prices are going to start to fall. Um, uh, outright decline. I think that could actually happen again before the even before we get to the end of the year. These things take time, though. I mean, I, it's funny. I, 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 I sort of been chuckling. I, I guess macro is such in focus, and 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 maybe these are conversations that we should have been happening having with people over the you know the the, the couple of decades that I've been doing this. These things take time to develop. Um, if if it's already in front of you, right? Like if everything that I'm talking about is so, uh, uh, or, or if, if if housing is falling into a recession, the consumers already slowing, then it's too late, right? Like it's like you have no leading. You know, there, there's no lead there. I mean, we're talking about things that take time to develop, um, and it's, it seems pretty clear to us that we're moving in that direction. That things are slowing more meaningfully than is appreciated. Some of these things, though, Tom. Are the objective. They're the objective. And I wonder when we get to that more problematic phase. And I just wonder yeah. how high the hurdle is for not for this Fed to cut, but for this Fed to pause. Pause. I, I, I Jonathan, I agree with that. I, I think that the, 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 the real risk here, look, uh, we have our view, right? Our view is that the Fed basically stops um, uh, by the end of the year. I mean, you basically, you're going to be wow. at 350 and the hiking cycle is going to be done. Um, but <laughs> I think the real risk. And, and let me be clear, I think that's absolutely the right move. You know, get policy into so you have somewhat restrictive territory, let that marinate, um, and then I think you know, we'll, we'll be in fine shape next year, uh, relatively fine shape. Make no mistake, things are going to slow. But the real risk is that the Fed does not unhitch its wagon from um, inflation, particularly headline prices, and that they just keep on going. And I, I think you guys are going to Jackson Hole, by the way. I'm disappointed I'm not speaking to you in Jackson Hole. I was hoping to see a bear rolling around behind you. <laughs> I think the one thing that people oh, need to do is <laughs> eating marmite. I, Tom, I, I heard how nervous you are about this. It's hysterical to me. By the way, if you want to see bears, come up to where I live in Westchester. There's bears everywhere. It's actually amazing. But they're not um, great. The they're a lot in Wall Street, too. <laughs> I'll have you up for drinks one day, Tom. We'll, we'll talk about bears. So oh, I think you got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one thing that is really compelling, and the thing that I think we really need to hold the, Fe the Fed's uh, the, their feet to the fire on is, what do they really want to see from inflation? Because if you're waiting for inflation to get to two percent, this is going to funds are going to be meaningfully higher than anyone appreciates. I don't think that that's what they're going to do. I think that they know better than that, and I think they just need to sort of sell that narrative. But I, I think if that's act, if I'm wrong, and they actually keep on hiking rates, the hiking cycle will go on for meaningfully longer than anyone appreciates, and the recession will be meaningfully deeper than anyone appreciates. Tom, great to catch up. Tom Porcelli of RBC Capital Markets. Welcome back anytime. Tom Porcelli there. Thank I've been looking forward to promoting this all morning. Coming up on the open as we count you down to the opening bell, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management, together with Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. So we'll speak to them for about 30 minutes and then we'll catch up with Julie Beale of Kane Anderson Rudnick around the opening bell. Just a brilliant lineup, TK, going into the opening bell this Wednesday morning. Looks good. And I think we saw the polarity there, John, of Andrew Hollenhorst as compared to Tom Porcelli. Remarkable. And I think Mike Wilson's going to have some different <coughs> opinions to the analyst that you mentioned, Tom, about 10 minutes ago. We will see that. It'll be more than interesting. Kolanovich publishes and, of course, we'll listen from Michael Wilson with... Uh, John Farrell I'll see you at LaGuardia, TK. I'm gone. See you in a bit. Oh, are you with me?
I'll be with you. I, did, I didn't know I they were leaving a little bit that. earlier than me, but I'll, I'll see uh, you Anthony after Anthony from Sparta emailed me. Maybe that's he wants me to get on a different plane. Just to change things a bit. We'll see. We'll have to see. Right <laughs> now we're going to continue. We're coming to you commercial-free this half hour. Douglas Cass scheduled to join us on the death of Julian Robertson. But right now, an important essay by Sri Natarajan and Julie Serene on Goldman Sachs. And Sri, I'm going to cut to the, the, the force of your essay on consumer banking at Goldman Sachs. Is it Marcus by David Solomon? How much is their leader attached to this consumer project? Well, he certainly vowed to stay the course, and this is a pet project that he has embraced, and he wants to go the course. But inside and outside questions are being raised on the execution of this strategy. Since inception, we're talking about losses set to hit more than $4 billion through the end of this year. That is effectively a giant money-losing startup inside the bank, subsidized by its more successful operations in trading and banking and elsewhere. And as these, as you don't see a turnaround anytime soon, patients will start to wear thin. And you are starting <clears> to <throat> see that inside the firm. And the latest example of this is another uh, possible right. delay with the launch of the checking account, which has been delayed for over a year anyway, and just one of the series of issues that the unit has been hit by in recent months. Sri, the, the heart and soul of this, in, in any number of books, Goldman Sachs has always been a firm and a partnership debate. Is everyone on the same page here, or is this a heated debate within the firm? No, absolutely not. It, it would be impossible to say with a straight face that everyone inside the firm is on the same page with respect to consumer. When you have a unit, when you have this new project that's lost so much money, questions will be asked like, is the lagging stock price, is the fact that they've not really been made a jump with respect to our travels, Morgan Stanley, or even JP Morgan for that matter, because of the fact that they were too reliant on their core Wall Street activities that have always been discounted by shareholders? Or is there some reason for us to look at projects like this where you're losing a lot of money, where you don't have the expertise, and you still have to wait quite a bit longer to get to the David Solomon, I told you so moment? Sri, so let's take a step back for a second. Goldman Sachs made a very public foray into the consumer banking sector for years. A lot of people were wondering how it would really transform the bank. Now there is a pause to one major aspect of this rollout. At what point is this because of competition? At what point is this because of something specific to the moment that they tried to get into consumer banking? I think it's a little bit of the moment and also a lot to do with their execution. Uh, they have spent... They have had forecasts. They, have had, they had hoped to be able to break even in this whole unit by this year. That's not happening. It doesn't even look like that's going to happen next year. They stopped giving forecasts. They were transparent about all these numbers in the early years when they were losing uh, $1 billion through inception. Their CFO was very happy to get on a call and tell investors and analysts that because they wanted to be, make sure that they were held accountable and be clear to the market that they recognize the losses up front, but they see that as an investment that will pay off. But as the losses continue, Continue to become deeper, and it isn't clear when the inflection point comes. It becomes a little bit of a sore point, and, and that's why I say it's not just the fact that we're heading into a challenging economy or a possible difficult market for consumers. It is also to do with the execution of this unit inside a firm that really is known all over the world for its core Wall Street prowess. So, Sri, and to sort of to elaborate on this, because a lot of people will take this news that they're possibly delaying the rollout of uh, checking accounts and say, well, what does this mean for other big banks in terms of their consumer units, especially given how much they tried to expand in those areas. Are you saying that this is an idiosyncratic story built out of an ambition that came at the wrong time and executed in, uh, in, in poorly? Uh, or are you saying that this is something that we might see the nodes of in other big investment banks? I think what we've seen with at least the larger mass market, the bigger consumer banks, is any sort of issues that they have in one segment of the market, they're able to offset it in other facts. It's the fact that you are in a rising rate environment means that you have the big banks of the JP Morgan and the B of A's happy with the increasing net interest income. They can adjust their tools and pull different levels to make sure that no one issue is going to stand out as a big hurdle. For Goldman, that is not necessarily the case. It is a it is very much a show-me story right now. And because there is so much scrutiny and so much focus on where costs are going in that business, I think they right. feel the pressure to need to thread the needle and execute perfectly. Sri, so you and Jenny, uh, very quickly here, you and Jenny kill it at the bottom of this essay in talking about it takes $500 to acquire an account 
And even with that, they lose 15% of their accounts per year. Why do they want to do this? Why do they want to, you know, co uh, compete with Fortress Diamond or Fortress Moynihan? Well, now that Goldman has decided to have this consumer finance arm, their CEO has always been of the opinion that you can't just go there and offer lending products and saving products and investing products without building that primary relationship with the consumer, which he sees as a checking account, and perhaps rightfully so. Your paycheck goes in there. You can easily pay off your bills. That is sort of the gateway to a lot more products, but it has become much harder. And truth be told, even if you have to think about other products, banks have become very good at targeting consumers that you don't necessarily need to rely on a massive checking footprint to be able to achieve that. And the numbers clearly show that. And part of the discussion inside Goldman is when you have to spend something like $500 per customer to lure them to open a checking account with you and you're aiming to have millions and millions of customers, that cost can quickly ramp up. And that is one of the reasons why right. the leadership in there and sitting and praying and thinking these things over right now. Sri, thank you so much, and congratulations on uh, driving this story forward. Sri Natarajan and Jenny Serain there with an important essay on uh, Goldman Sachs. Lisa, very quickly here before we get to Doug Cass, boy, is this an experiment in progress. Especially because it was one that was such a very sharp de <clears throat> departure from what the Goldman Sachs bread and butter has been, which is investment banking. To be pulling back on this area at a time when investment banking also is struggling with capital markets activity falling really raises a lot of questions about what the fortunes of Wall Street are going to be like. And I understand this is a specific story, but still a really notable moment in the rising rate environment and why yeah. banks may or may not benefit on the other end. I wanted to talk to one person. I'm going to get upset here on Julian Robertson. One person yesterday I wanted to talk to. Douglas Cass and Kidder Peabody a million years ago when Julian Robertson out of the Navy, out of Chapel Hill, said, I'm going to go to Kidder Peabody and he was restless. Doug Cass <laughs> How restless was the giant those many years ago? Well, let me explain my relationship with him, Tom and Lise. Uh, I was only 22 years old when I met Julian. Um, I had just graduated with an MBA at Wharton, and my first job on Wall Street was at 10 Hanover Square as a housing analyst at Kittery Peabody and Company. And now Julian had an off a small office just like me. Actually, he's right next to me. He was working out of the New York City office of Webster Management, which was the investment management arm of Kidder, which was run out of Boston and headed by a guy, Gerald Curtis. Uh, working with him in New York City were two young kids about my age, Tom Dean and Thorpe McKenzie, and an older marketing guy, at least he seemed old, or maybe he was 28 years old, Alan Fleming, whose son Peter would team up with John McEnroe to become the right. number one doubles team in tennis in the world. Anyway, he was really nice to me, Julian. We probably chatted five times a day. I really wanted to manage money ultimately, so I was always picking his brain. Uh, I remember he was kind enough with Ralph D'Annunzio, who was then president of Kidder at the time, to sponsor me for admission to the Princeton Club of New York a year after we met. I also remember in the beginning he forgot my name all the time. <laughs> well, he, he forgot my guys. name too. He called me Tiger, <laughs> and I would later find out that he called everyone. He forgot their names, Tiger, and for that reason, he named Doug. his hedge fund Tiger Management. But I have one interesting analytical confrontation Please. with him that I don't want to miss. Uh, I was a kidder for a year or so, which is sort of time, and I'm going to time. I'm going to frame his intensity, his analytical intensity. At the time, I was Kidder's housing analyst, and I wrote an extensive. 75-page <laughs> industry review on a very hot group in the market, the mobile home and recreational yeah. vehicle industry. And not surprisingly, Tom, I was negative on the group in recommending short sale. Um, <laughs> anyway, Julian's group owned the stocks, Champion Home Builders, Skyline, mm -hmm. Redmond, and Fleetwood Enterprises. And I vividly remember his intensity. He would bring in sandwiches for lunch with uninvited, plop them in my office during that period. Right. And have his analysts and two other sell-side analysts grill me. They were bullish to debate me continuously. And he ended up selling the stocks on my advice, and the stocks plummeted with Redmond and Champion almost Great. filing. Okay. I, I think Champion <clears throat> bought bankruptcy. Doug. But from there on, he respected me, and he remembered my name, Dougie. So much, so much of it, Doug Cass, is about what Sebastian Malaby wrote about. It's about the charity of he and Josie and, and, and everything he did for New York. Doug, how did he get? From the office next to you 
to what Sebastian Malaby wrote about in that book. How did he make the jump to the something jump? called a hedge fund? That's a great, great question. I think the key to his success, and it's something Stanley Druckenmiller always reminds me and others of. May, we, May West had this line. She used to say, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. Julian made big bets after doing comprehensive and exhaustive analysis and research. Um, uh, and, and I think that, that is the answer. He believed in his analysis, put his money where his mouth was. And, of course, he was an uncommon, had this uncommon ability to find talent. But like all of us, he wasn't perfect. A good example was Bill Huang, one of his uh, disciples who famously blew up Archegos. So um, yeah. that, that was a blemish. Well, let's get Lisa Bram. What's in here, Lisa? Well, Doug, I'm just thinking uh, about the legacy of someone who redefined many ways that people believed in the hedge fund industry. Doug, what do you think his legacy, in addition to all his tiger cubs that he seeded and helped to support, what is his legacy, his imprint on the business of hedge funds? I honestly think, as a humanist, his legacy was not making all that money. Remember, he started with eight and a half million dollars in 1980. It became 22 billion by 1998. I I don't think that was it. I think that he transferred his generosity, his charity, and his philanthropic style and endeavors to his disciples: Griffin, Coleman, Haverson. Lafont, Mandel, and I think that that's his legacy, his charitable right. giving. Doug, we're out of time. Doug Cass, thank you so much from Seabreeze uh, Partners. Greatly appreciate that. Lisa, we've got to get set here for uh, tomorrow as well. It's not, This is an unusual Jackson Hole, Lisa, period. Especially because we have reset our expectations for monetary policy, and I think that it is right that you and John have been speaking all morning about the euro. It shows the futility of rate hikes to support an economy in the traditional ways, i.e. through a stronger currency. You could see that, that right now we're seeing the euro continue to deteriorate well below parity. How much does this create a real friction at Jackson Hole well, uh, with the likes? Andrew Bailey, obviously, with the pan, with the pound also falling out of bed, but uh, also uh, Schnabel of the ECB speaking as well. Yeah, I wish Lagarde was going to be there, but that'll be interesting to see Schnabel uh, as well. Lisa, what I would suggest is as FX is a litmus paper of the international system. It's something that Chairman Powell has to watch every tick of the way, even with oil 100.62. The other thing that I think will be really compelling will be the neutral rate. And we've heard a lot about uh, that this show. Yes, and just the dis <clears throat> disagreement about how high the Fed funds rate has to go to really become in balance with an inflation rate that the headline shows around 8.5%, right? Is it okay to just go to 3.5% and stay there? Can they stay there in good conscience right. if they're looking at inflation that is much stickier? And by many accounts, it is. So a chart, Lisa, let's finish with this. It's in your world. It was the spreads coming in on bonds. I mean, doesn't the spread market have to deteriorate to single signal the angst that's out there that so many people feel? Well, this is one thing that's been supporting the equity market because you're not seeing that angst in credit. And if credit's a leading indicator, it's not really indicating significant pain. There are a lot of issues with this, right? The cash flow, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How do you forecast a recession at a time when you're not seeing it in the anecdotal data? And that has been something that's been <clears throat> uh, challenging for investors throughout the year. Uh, we are off to Wyoming. We hope you'll join us here in the next coming days. Just a wonderful set of guests, uh, all led by Michael McKee and his effort in the academic part of Jackson Hole, and of course, with his careful analysis of the chairman's speech Friday morning with a two hour uh, time delay. Lisa warned me on the break that I have to get up early, which I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so That's maybe we'll hopefully get you, depending on whether we can uh, get you out of the. Out of the grill? What's the it called bear, again? The, the, yeah, in the, the bear-proof bear hotel room. Uh, red and green on the screen right now. Yield, uh, a little bit higher yield. Your 3.34% on the two-year yield is of north. We will see you in Wyoming tomorrow.